And we are live here on Plus One EXP's Roll for Content channel. My name is Tony Vicenda. I am Chief Alchemist here at Plus One EXP, which is a weird little brand that multi-classes in tabletop game design, beard and skincare alchemy in the Bardic College of Content Creation. Um, we love helping people discover new games, see new games. We do that in a lot of different ways here on the channel, but right now we're in the third part um, of a 15-part actual play campaign of The Between. Um, if you are just joining us, um, we've got an amazing cast of folks you're going to meet in just one minute, but let's kick it over to Jason Cordova, creator of The Between and head of Gauntlet Publishing, to tell us uh, a little bit about what this game is all about. You are muted to me, Jason. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so thank you, Tony. The Between is a game about monster hunters in Victorian era London. Uh, they they are trying to stop monstrous threats terrorizing the streets of London, and eventually they will have to confront the nefarious uh, planning and uh, in interference of a criminal mastermind who we have met briefly uh, in this particular campaign. I can't hear Tony now. <laughs> Hardware. <maybe>. Dang it! <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel so bad now. <laughs> um, we um, uh, we have a bunch of great people who we are playing with tonight, like I said. Uh, so let's go ahead and meet those folks. Uh, maybe give a little bit of an intro to your character for folks who are catching us late. We'll probably fade this into the background in the next couple of episodes and just start diving right in. But um, let's start with... Uh, because... Uh, audio, video, and everything are in full effect. Um, let's start with Vin. Vin, why don't you tell people about who you are and tell us a little bit about Rick. Oh my gosh, hi. Uh, I'm Vin at VinVonksVA on Twitter. Uh, I'm a voice actor, I'm a tabletop performer, and tonight I'll be playing Rick Miller, the American. Awesome, so excited to have you with us. Uh, let's kick it up to, uh, let's start with Lord Bastion Gray this week. Hello, hello, hello. I'm BNR, voice actor, tabletop RPG writer sometimes, actual play performer, drama queen. And I'm super happy to be here. Uh, and I'm playing Lord Bastion Gray, uh, the undeniable. And we'll see how tonight goes. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, and then the Factotum Langfisk coming live from Boston. Not That's to, right. To dox your location to everyone right now. Hey, it's okay. That's right. I'm live and alive here in Boston, Massachusetts for PAX East. Uh, my name is Wes Franks. My pronouns are they, he. If you're at the convention uh, and you see me, uh, I promise I look meaner than I really am. Come say hi to me. Uh, but yeah, no, I'm here. I'm so excited to be playing the between. Uh, and I'm playing Langfis, the fat totem, pronouns he, him, all the way from Australia uh, to come and make sure that Lord Bastion Gray doesn't get into too much trouble and doing a not good job at it so far. Awesome. Uh, I love it. I'm, I'm going to hand things over to Jason in just one minute. We were going to do a giveaway tonight, but I think we're going to wait till next week. Um, a lot of you may have seen today that I was out of action for the last week. Um, I uh, pushed through last week and my back was already in a lot of pain and I woke up the next day not really able to move. So I'm feeling much better after uh, a couple chiropractic appointments and a number of other things. Um, but um, we're going to push back till next week. We are going to do a giveaway over the course of the next week. Uh, uh, for people who share their favorite moment in one of the first three episodes on social media also, too. So uh, feel free to clip things tonight, uh, capture a moment, whether it's on YouTube, uh, Twitch. We're going to ask folks to share those over the next little bit. It can be from tonight's episode or either of the previous two episodes. And if you win, you're going to get a copy of Brendelwood Bay and Nephews uh, in Peril, which are also by uh, Jason Cordova. Jason, you want to tell people what those two things are all about? Or if you have them nearby, you can hold them up. But I know that... You keep most of your games on the computer, so. No, I have them. Hold on, give me one second. Uh, yeah, here they are. Uh, so this is Brindlewood Bay, a beautiful hardcover book, and this is Nephews in Peril. Uh, I think I'm mirrored right now, but um, that's okay. Um, in any case, yeah. Uh, so Brindlewood Bay is my game about 
elderly women in a New England town who are members of a book club, a mystery book club, and they solve real life murders in their community because of their talents at uh, at solving mysteries from reading mystery books. Uh, the murder mavens is what they're called, and as they uh, uncover, uh, you know, as they sort of like solve these murders in their community, they start to uncover evidence of a, an occult conspiracy that is operating in the background. So we like to say that it's a sort of a Cthulhu she wrote uh, sort of game. So. Uh, super excited to uh, give some of those out, get people some copies. It is a, an absolutely phenomenal game. Uh, we've also got an actual play of it over on the channel with Jason. There's a bunch of them all over the place, some really great ones out there. Mm -hmm. um, but in our kind of classic style, we dig into the system while we play. So uh, with that said, Jason, I'm going to just hand things over to you to take us back into the between. Thank you, thank you. So we are starting with a new day phase and... Um, and we're going to recap what happened last time. Uh, but I think we're not quite done with what happened last time. I think I would like to revisit a moment with Lord Grey and Rick. Uh, because last night, the previous night, um, well, we learned a lot about Rick. And one of the things we learned is that um, sometimes when uh, the moon is high in the sky, uh, Rick has a terrible, uncontrollable transformation, and Lord Grey helped Rick get through that. And I think I'd like to just have a quick scene between the two of you, um, you know, kind of showing the morning after, so to speak, um, if that's okay with the two of you. And then also, Lord Grey, I, just, I, I noted that um, because of your exposure to this transformation, I was gonna scar your reflection. Your reflection is the masterwork that Dorian Gray style absorbs the stains of your soul in place uh, uh, of you absorbing them so that you can remain beautiful and uh, unblemished. Um, and so I'd like to know what that looks like as well. So let's just uh, set up the scene in Lord Gray's uh, pleasure chamber <laughs> inside Hargrave House uh, with the two of you just sort of early morning kind of coming out of that. I think you like there has been a few check-ins in the night to see if this is like stayed the same way. The door has never been opened, but occasionally he just knocks and he's like, Rick. <laughs> Hello. And I think eventually the door just like opens very slowly. Uh, you see him in a state. <laughs> clothes just like strands and tangles and dangles and such kind of surprisingly not embarrassed looking but quite stone faced just stoic um good morning it is a morning i'm not sure if it's good and he looks behind you into this wrecked room and looks at you with all of your clothes to is this normal? I don't recall this happening before, but what was that? Is it, would you ever put normal and Hargrave in the same sentence? Listen, there are some things that happen. This is beyond what we usually deal with. It's usually not. It looks like you chewed up my furniture. What was that? I'm sorry, I thought we were just uh, performing rituals and studying ghosts. I don't know where this would be opposite. It's not opposite, it's just usually not one of us, you know? And if this is going to be an every night thing, I think we could get you a, a, a special room, I'm sure. Um, you know, I, 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 I know people. No, this won't be an every night occurrence. Okay. I would honestly prefer if we just put this all behind us. Besides, 
you're talking about me. I distinctly remember, uh, I don't know, feeling like I was on fucking fire for uh -huh. a little artwork that's uh, hanging around in there. So, all right. I keep my secrets, you keep yours. And if you could just. Uh, all right, then. I'll keep this between us. That's what I thought. But I have to say, you mm -hmm. do look nice like this. So, uh, a little less layers, maybe. A little less layers in the future. That's in now. Yeah, I'll I'll definitely keep that. Uh, yes. Bastion, can we just skip the banter? I would like to get changed for the morning. And he steps aside and watches wherever you go and then looks back into the room just like, Cursing himself. <laughs> Lord Gray, let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about the masterwork. So I'm gonna read this part of your character sheet. It says <clears throat> somewhere in London, hidden from the world, is a masterwork created in your image or otherwise inspired by your beauty. It is guarded by a cult dedicated to your worship. What is the masterwork and how does it change? after this experience with Rick Miller? So, uh, would you like me to just say what the masterwork is and then answer the secondary question on there? Tell us as much as you want. Fabulous, okay. So this is a portrait painting. And the question on the sheet that follows that is, how do your worshipers demonstrate that they are unworthy to look upon it? We're in a room we've never seen before. It might be in Hargrave House, it might not be. Lamplight flickers off of smoke-stained walls. Shadows dance across frames and furniture draped in velvet cloth. Across lifelike statues. No, they're not statues. Those are people. Posted up in front of a larger-than-life oil painting. Two people stand at attention blindfolded with red lace. And in the low light, we catch a glimpse of the painting subject, Lord Bastion Gray, captured in exquisite detail, but there's something off about it. We don't get to linger on it long, and instead we watch the guard change. Two more people coming into the room, their eyes to the ground as they remove the old guard's blindfolds and trade places with them. And that's when we get to see how the portrait has changed. It doesn't quite look like the Bastion Gray we've seen. It looks somehow crueler. There's a there's something off about him. And Rick, you said being near me made it feel like you were on fire. And we see the fireplace behind Lord Gray in the portrait lights like someone put a match on it, and flames spill into the room, creeping towards him, and it casts harsh shadows on his face, revealing lines that you don't see in the flesh, Bastion Gray. And from a distance, it looks like hellfire. Thank you. <clears throat> the day phase. So... I'm going to recap briefly what happened last time. Jason, we're getting an echo, and I think it's because I have the wrong microphone selected. I'm going to let you keep on going, but I'm going to pause our audio recording so if we can take like a 30-second break um, and then oh, pop sure. into the day phase. That'd be great. Just one second. Do -do 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 -do. Uh... Also, chat, you can still hear us. How's it going? Everything's great. <laughs> Hope everyone's doing wonderful. I dropped some tarot pools, single card pools for all the players in the Discord with my Pulp Noir tarot deck. So it's not quite fitting, but you know, it's a little pulp. It's a little pulp. Uh, but yeah, we got Strength oh, Reverse for, for Rick. Yeah, yeah, Strength Reverse for Rick. 
I uh, have a tarot wand. deck. Oh. That's hilarious. <laughs> Chat, can you let me know if we're still getting the oh same gosh, winning. the Please. same echo or not? Um, I just want to check real quick. Uh, yeah, am I still echoing? Signal station says they don't hear an echo. Yeah, I think I had I had selected the wrong uh, I th had selected the wrong audio input. There is a specific one I have to check to prevent it from r ruining my mix minus. So we are all set. I'm going to hit record again for the audio, and Jason will pick up going into the day phase whenever you are ready. Okay, so we are starting with our day phase, <clears throat> and just a quick recap of what happened last time. You all managed to resolve the St. James's Street ghost threat by performing a sort of Stations of the Cross style ritual traveling through a, in a spiral through the house at St. James's Street, uh, sending the ghost on its way. And so, um, oh, I think I'm getting double sound again, according to the I'm chat. just going to have to, I'll just keep myself <laughs> muted and I'll figure it out another time. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, uh, so you managed to resolve the St. James Street ghost threat, uh, and you have another active threat, which is the Limehouse Lurker. Now, the Limehouse Lurker, you currently have three clues on this particular threat, and you're trying to figure out initially if this vampire terrorizing the district of Limehouse uh, is young or old. You know it's in a small body, but it could be an old vampire. And so you have three clues to help figure out that initial thing. Um, you have a handful of candy clutched in the hand of the dead sailor. Uh, there were Roman charcoal etchings or drawings on the wall um, in the opium den. And then there was a bundle of gardenias handed to uh, Dr. Aspectum with um, uh, the lurker, presumably who handing it to the, Dr. Aspectum saying these were her favorite. And a few other things happened uh, related to the opium den. In particular, Rick Miller had an interesting encounter with a strange individual wearing a sun-shaped mask. Um, that was probably one of the more uh, uh, interesting and unusual things there. Also, there is just this interesting detail that Dr. Spectum, at least, was being watched by the Limehouse Lurker. So another thing to kind of be mindful of. And with all that said, I do want to take a look really quickly at the hunters as well and see what conditions we have going on here. Everybody has a, a well, Langfisk only has one, uh, but everybody else has <clears throat> two active conditions. And so if you are thinking about clearing those, maybe think about some vulnerable move scenes that might help you get those cleared in this day phase. And because there are fewer than three active threats, I'm gonna introduce a brand new threat. And so if you want to follow along players, it's there in the character keeper in the threat section. This threat is called the Creature of Cremorn Gardens. That ever reliable rag, the Illustrated Police News, has lately been carrying stories about the so-called Creature of Cremorn Gardens, sometimes called the Creature of Chelsea Harbor, and more rarely the Creature of Chain Walk. The Creature, described as a fish-like thing, or a fish man, has been terrorizing pleasure seekers from the shadows, giving a fright when glimpsed skulking about, but rarely making direct eye contact, or direct contact rather. Men and women alike have been lured to the end of a nearby pier by a, quote, strange song while promenading, though with no memory of how they got there once the song's spell ended. All of this could easily be chalked up to hysteria, or perhaps some elaborate hoax by someone who re uh, resents Cremorn Gardens, if not for a physical attack upon a young couple, Simon Piedmont and Beulah Thrum. Mr. Piedmont and Ms. Thrum described how the creature leapt at them from a crouched, crouched position like a cat and tore at Ms. Thrum's coat. Scotland Yard is investigating. I'm going to pose a question to, I think, Mr. Miller. Mr. Miller, you have a connection to Thomas Simpson, the proprietor of Cremorne Gardens, having worked there one summer. What was your job and what did you do to lose it? 
and I'll note here in case it needs to be clarified, Cremorne Gardens is, it's kind of like the Victorian equivalent uh, of a theme park. It's a place to go walk around, hang out. Uh, they have like, you know, uh, fortune tellers and shooting galleries and bowling alleys and that kind of thing, right? So. Surprisingly, uh, he wasn't at like the shooting galley. Uh, he was part of the actual uh, horticulture and gardening um, mm -hmm. members. And I think he was caught sleeping on the job, just like resting in some rose bushes and someone mistook him for like uh, a decoration. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So you have a connection to Thomas Simpson. Um, maybe not a great connection, but you do know the proprietor of Cremorne Gardens. And we do have one question to start here, uh, which is, is the creature, this so-called fish man, is it real or is it a hoax? Um, it's a complexity four. And if you answer it correctly, you get to unlock the, next, unlock the next question. You also have available here an aspect of the Janus mask called the Mask of Revelry. Each hunter narrates a flashback to the last truly fun day they had. And so that is the creature of Cremorne Gardens, something else for Hargrave House to look into. I want to go around the table and find out what everyone's interested in doing for the day phase. Um, I'll remind you that some things you might want to focus on are uh, the investigations, of course, but you might also want to frame up vulnerable scenes with another hunter in order to clear conditions. You may also want to frame a scene that will help you answer one of your Dawn questions in the affirmative. Um, maybe you can do all three if you're really clever. But in any case, I'm going to go around the table and see what everyone's interested in. Let's start with um, let's start with Doctor Aspectum. <sighs> um, I think um, Doctor Aspectum is super torn between taking the morning off due to my horribly bruised throat and the enthralling specimen specimen I saw in the basement at. Uh, at um, the Opium Den. Um, I do think we are going to tr uh, try to do a vulnerable scene. Um, um, I... Does anybody else want to do a vulnerable scene? I guess I'll ask because then we can, we can two for one it. Is there anybody else who... I can only ask Lord Gray, but if you want to ask Langfisk, then I can do oh, it. Oh no, but I'm happy to, to initiate it in character. I'm just curious if anybody else is is actively yeah. looking to. And Langfisk is who I'm actually I would most be inclined to, because I don't know if you recall this, but my vice is coffee. And I did have been slowly giving Langfisk pieces of a very fine silver coffee set uh in your room, implying that it might be nice. Um, if you started regular coffee service at the household. Um, but I, I just don't know if you picked up on that yet or not. Let's have that scene. Yeah, let's do it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I have dragged you out to a, a coffee. Like, I have not been able to convince you to um, uh, engage in making coffee at the house. And at this point, I'm just going to assume it's because you don't understand a how good coffee is, and b generally the process for how to do it. So I have dragged you to a local um, uh, coffee, um, like a cafe slash coffee house, um, to uh, to kind of give you the culinary experience and kind of show you that even though even though tea is very popular both um, down under as well as here in in London that. Um, Really, the the more refined palate oftentimes seeks out the goodness of a just a a well produced uh, cup of coffee. the The reality is the beans from Java at this point in time. The, the amount of time they spend on the boat soaking up the aroma and the flavor of uh, of the ocean as it comes. The the rich, vibrant spice uh, that pops out is just intense. And if if you could sh just wrap your mind around. Um, how to produce it? I, it would it would absolutely um, absolutely elevate the experience of most Hargrave House members, and I think I've specifically implied that I think uh, Lord Gray would really appreciate this also too. That would just be a tremendous experience for them in order to kind of get you to this place. It's coffee. 
correct, but it's not just look look around us. Look at the people mixing in this place right now. Look at look at those coming and going. The the myriad of human the the curvature of the shoulder of the server as they as they bend over as um as as look at look at those two folks over in the corner obviously engaged in in a connection uh, in a lovers in a, in, a, in, a, in a tenuous lovers embrace trying to feel out not not physically but just in conversation where can we go from here coffee facilitates not just the the sensory experience of it. It's not just the uplifting nature that it provides the mind. It is specifically how it transforms human society. Tea, tea is fine, but it doesn't have the same, the same potency that, that a fine cup of coffee can provide. So what I'm getting at this, Knox, is that uh, you thinking that if we introduce more coffee service into the house, especially for Little Gray, it's going to bring us together somehow, uh, in, in in a way that uh, will make us feel more enjoyable. I'll tell you what I see here, Knox. I see two cunts in the corner over there. All right, having a conversation, and then what I see over in the back of this shop is another cunt reading a book because that cunt thinks that he's better than everybody else and he has to go and show that he reads books out in public, all right? And what are we? Two cunts that have jobs to do. But you're right. This is damn fine good coffee. Also, I, I have no idea what the two of you have been up to the last couple of days, but Lord Grey looked horrible last week. You want to say that again? With the scratches all over, all over his face. Knox. I'll be very patient with you, bub. Because you're, uh, you're an associate. We work close together, and we're going to work close together for a long time here, bub. Lord Grey has been through a very trying time. As my lord likes to put himself in situations that test their capabilities. I do my best, but you know how it is. You uh, high society types like to uh, put yourself in situations that are where you overreach. Um, but my lord Grey does it in his best interest. My Lord Grey single-handedly took down a woman who was possessed by a specter and crept into his bedroom, managed to get his arms around her and squeeze tightly so she passed out. And then they called the Bobby and got her taken care of. I didn't even have to step in. He didn't want me to. I appreciate your concern, Doctor. But how about we keep your diagnosis and opinion of Lord Grey to just medical? And I don't want to hear you speaking about how awful they look. They look resplendent, mate. Oh, that feels like a good it's place a great to, place to stop. <laughs> pause the scene momentarily. I, uh, I want to check in on these conditions. I mean... I, I'm guessing, uh, Doctor Spectum. I'm guessing that like maybe bruise throat. Oh, I'm only getting rid of bruise throat. There's no way I'm getting. I'm getting rid of yeah. my other condition. That one's gonna play for a little while. Yeah, Langfisk. Um, I don't know if you want to try to make a case for cut leg, but uh, I will. I will let you if you want to try. <laughs> I, I, I would say that like it, it's probably not necessarily the coffee itself that has healing properties, but I think it's probably been a little bit of time since that cut that that scrape. Just some time has I might, passed. I might Just also pitch: is passed. this maybe maybe this is maybe my maybe my rec like my payment for my services helping with your leg was you coming out. To the yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's that's really that was good. the I, like that. Like, yeah, I will help yeah. you with your leg, but 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> you've got to you've got to go get coffee Perfect. with me. Um, I think that's clever. Yeah. Um, so here's the thing. As well, because it's your vice in the vulnerable move, um, Dr. Aspectum, you can either stumble on a clue or you can invite Langfisk to ask you a question about your past. You must answer truthfully, but not necessarily completely. This is one of those rare opportunities to talk about your past freely with another character. Or you can find a clue. I... I man, the the CFB power gamer in me just really wants to go for that clue. Um, but we've got 15 full episodes, and and I actually am super curious as a player what Wes will ask. So I think we're gonna let Wes ask uh have ask, we'll have um Lingfisk ask a character of or ask a question of uh of Knox. Think about your question. I'm gonna cut over to see what the others are doing. Um Lord Gray, what are you doing today? Well, I'm, uh, I'd like to go talk to some people that got missed about the, um, oh, the lurker, lurker, the lurker, some of the other folks. I, I am trying to recall their names and the places. Uh, I'll give you some leads. Um, so you all have looked pretty thoroughly at the opium den, so Mm -hmm. we don't worry about that so much. Um, although that is where the bodies are being stored. Um, you can also go check the Limehouse School, um, which is okay. where uh, the alleyway behind which is where one of the bodies was found, as well as there's a pub near the dock called the Dog and Whistle, where a sailor was found dead. Um, so those are those are places where the lurker was at least at because three because two of the victims were found in those places. What do you think? All right, absolutely, yeah. I'll uh, I'll go to the school. Okay. Um, let me check with Mr. Miller then. Mr. Miller, what do you want to do? Um, excuse me. I think I want to uh, start off uh, the creature of Crimmore Gardens by going out to the gardens. Sounds Talking good. Talking to... Um, yeah. I love it. Why don't we start with... Well, let's start with Crimmore Gardens, actually. So... Crimmore Gardens is this sort of like pleasure garden was a thing that was popular in Victorian times. Though historically, Cremorne Gardens itself, it was a real place. It only lasted a couple years. And if you actually go to London now, the site of Cremorne Gardens, it's still there, but all it is is like a single tree and bench and nothing else. It's just surrounded by buildings. So that's kind of fun. But in our time, in our London, it is, it's huge. It's this enormous green space with beautiful, like, tree-lined walks and manicured gardens, which you know, Mr. Miller, because you used to work on them. Um, There is, there's a number of other things to see as well. I kind of call a few out. At night, there, well, there's, there's this large dancing platform that at night holds, like, literally thousands of dancers. Um, There is an American bowling saloon. Uh, There's a banquet hall. Um, You have the promenade, of course. There's a hedge maze. The Cremorne Gardens is also next to, um, it's next to an artist commune street called Chain Walk. And it is also by, by a little pier like uh, it, it it connects up to the thames so there's there's a lot to see and do here as you arrive mr miller i think you'll arrive on the day when a hot air balloon is being set off and you can see a rapturous crowd applauding as the balloon you know begins its ascent uh, this balloon is an enormous red and gold striped balloon kind of climbing into the air. Um, somewhere else, there are tightrope walkers, and you hear a cry of distress from the crowd and then relief as the tightrope walker kind of wavers on the tightrope but manages to recover their balance. Um, and it's just a lovely scene. There's just lots of people around. It's very pleasant. Um, what do you do? Um, I'm going to go just directly with this 
name Thomas? Thomas Simpson, yeah, the proprietor. Yeah. Yeah. I think That's you actually boss man. Yeah. I think you actually get approached first by Abigail Simpson, who is Tom uh, Thomas's daughter. Uh, she's the one who actually runs the place. Um, she wears a very simple sort of utilitarian dress and her hair is pulled back in a neat bun. She has a very no-nonsense attitude. You'll remember that from about her. And she, she says, well, <clears throat> as I live and breathe, it's Mr. Rick Miller. Have you come to beg for your job back? No, but it's nice to see you, Abby. How are you? That's how conversations usually start, you know. Yes, well, I guess I'm still just a little stung that I put my neck on the line for you with my father and you managed to make me look like a fool. Well, it's nice to see it still connected to your head and your shoulders. Um, can I say that I am here to help? Uh, there's a, I heard there was a situation and I came to investigate. <laughs> Let me guess. This is about the so-called creature of Cremorne Gardens, the terrible fish man. Yes, exactly. I'm trying to save your business. Mr. Miller, if there really was a fish man creeping about this place, my father would have already captured it, put it in a tank, and raised a tent. A joey to go in and have a look, thank you very much. But since he hasn't done that, I think it's probably safe to say there's not actually a fish man roaming around. Then allow me to walk around as a guest. I could walk around with you if you'd like. I'm about to take a break. Oh, this is a brand new attitude. I would love to. I would. I bet there's some new attractions you're just dying to show me. I might have, um, I might have something to show you that you'd be very interested in. Though certainly not this time of day. Mm. And mm. she takes your arm. <laughs> and leads you down the promenade, we'll say. Let's check in with Lord Grey. Lord Grey, you are... Hmm. The Limehouse School. So the Limehouse School is not actually a school. It's a workhouse. Um, there are filthy children all over the place when you arrive. There is a frustrated uh, schoolmistress uh, storming away from a group of girls who are busy not learning how to sew. Um, a quite overpowering smell of unwashed bodies. Let's paint the scene, everyone. Workhouses like this are where poor children are sent to be managed until they're old enough to be turned out. What signs of deprivation do we see all around? Um, we see oh go ahead tony hit it uh, i want to see if i'm in your brain there's a big uh there's a a number of of educational and inspirational uh maxims posted around um on large kind of uh faded boards um the largest one at the front of the room says uh happy happy children make more with less Said children can be seen uh, in an alleyway nearby when they're on their break. Uh, one of the big boys has a stick and the other ones are cheering him on as he's trying to beat a rat so they can have a nice little lunch. I think the kids we see uh, trying to beat a rat, uh, the majority of them don't have shoes. And being unable to keep clean clothing, uh, most things are just tossed around in piles. 
like rips and sews and blood and everything else. Lord Grey, I imagine you stick out in a scene like this. How are you dressed? How do you compare to all the people around you right now? I think it's, I mean, all of his clothes are wildly extravagant. And there's this like brocade fabric on a jacket. But for him, this is like subdued. Because he probably knew the place he was going, but he still like sticks out like a sore thumb. Because it is like these rich golds and greens and reds. It's like just... This man has is completely detached from reality. <laughs> I love it. We'll pick up with you in a moment. I want to check back in with Langfisk and Dr. Spectum. Langfisk, what's your question? Doc, you've uh, you've done me such a great service, bringing such a low-born bloke like me to such a nice, fancy establishment like this. You mind if I ask you a question, though, there, Doc? Hmm, yes. You seem a bit rougher around the edges than uh, the normal medical staff I've come across in my day and time. Uh, did you educate yourself in the ways of medicine at a school anywhere, or were you a bit of a battlefield medicine type? Uh, I've met quite a few of those that, uh, well, they made it through a couple of wars or some skirmishes, and they're like, might as well set up a practice. Well, I did spend some time abroad um, and have seen some of the terrors of war. The vast majority of my education was privately funded. Um, when my father passed, the, um, the estate he left was not small, and it afforded for really the finest tutors. Um, we, we did go through... A good number of them, though. Not not all of them really had the stomach to give me the finest education that they really could have. Mom and Charles, um, they took care of the ones that weren't a good fit, though. Well, it's nice to know that... Uh... You're able to maintain a high-class uh, side of yourself, but you can also get your hands dirty. That's a nice quality to have in a person, especially a doctor. Say, Doc, uh, the next time uh, you decide that you get a wild hair and you want to take yourself a break, and you need a little bit of a, let's say you need an escort to help you around, why don't I, uh, I can give you a bit of show of, uh, What kind of coffee shops I like to go to, huh? That sounds delightful. Anywhere there's a good cup. <laughs> there's quite a few good cups, mate. <laughs> Some. <laughs> ah, jeez. Fantastic. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Miller, as you are walking along with Abigail Simpson arm in arm, You'll notice that all the workers seem to be like they're in preparation for something special going on soon. In fact, the Cremorne Gardens is lit with gas lamps like so many other places in the city, but this has a this has, you know, lanes of gas lamps. And normally they have these beautiful emerald green glass globes. Um, and the gas lamps are like statues of Artemis and Athena and Aphrodite, but the green glass globes are currently being replaced by deep blue glass globes. I would like for you, um, I think at this point, assuming that you're kind of just chatting with Abigail and you've already kind of approached the subject of the creature, I want you to go ahead and make the information move. I think with presence because of the nature of this uh, interaction. And let's see how that goes. Oh boy, oh golly, oh gee. Uh, that is a nine. A nine, um, fantastic. I think as you're walking with 
Abigail. She says, you know, I was probably being a little defensive earlier when I said I didn't think that there was actually anything going on. But the fact of the matter is, is there is something strange going on here. I'm doing everything I can to keep these stories out of the papers. I, Father trusts me to run this business, to help take this business to the next level. I have a sense of what I think is going on though. How much do you know about Madame Tussauds? What do I know? Because uh, well, like you can just moment. I don't know. You, you can just use your your player knowledge if you wish. Doesn't matter to me. All right. Um, I mean, I don't think that's the ring of bells or Madame Tussauds is something. A waxwork museum. They are something of a competitor. And I happen to know that they are currently creating a horrors of the sea waxwork exhibit. You know, krakens and undersea monstrosities, that sort of thing. And I think it's awfully suspicious that right as they're getting ready to launch this new terrifying exhibit, we start to be terrorized by a fish man. I just think it's too, it's too much of a coincidence. I think maybe they're trying to create some sort of organic viral, if you will, marketing stunt. I say like guerrilla tactics, but marketing. Uh, look, if that means I have to fish out, uh, not intended, a wax statue out the water, then I'd do it for you. I have to ask, Mr. Miller, why this sudden interest in what's going on here? Why are you, do you really love this place so much? Well, I don't want to see you fail, and... Perhaps I owe you after sticking my neck out, however you said it. Uh, well, <clears throat> she kind of like leads you to a little, uh, like a bench. And she says, well, I appreciate I appreciate your help, but um, maybe you should let me pay you back somehow. Perhaps. And just what did you have in mind, Miss Abigail? Well, I was thinking about maybe, I was thinking about maybe actually doing a little bit of dancing tonight. I know I don't normally participate, but I have the night off. And if you'd like to come back and join me on the dancing platform, I would be delighted. <laughs> oh, that is that is absolutely charming. Sure, I, I would love to go dancing with you. I think uh, your complication on this clue uh, the clue is the existence of Madame Tussauds' upcoming Horrors of the Deep Waxwork. The complication is just that I'm going to give you a condition that is like a history with Abigail Simpson because there's clearly something going on here, right? And, I, and I'm, I'd like to <laughs> memorialize it and explore it. Let's cut back over to Lord Grey. Lord Grey... Okay. You are immediately approached by um, 
a very fidgety looking middle-aged man wearing a brown three-piece suit he he comes up to you and just by the state of your dress he assumes you must be a member of the peerage and he says uh, uh my lord uh, uh are you are you one of our um are you one of our generous benevolent donors are, 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 are you a philanthropist uh, or are I, you from the city perhaps that's none of your concern my friend i'm here to talk to someone oh um well i i'm i'm the <clears throat> i'm the uh, the headmaster here at the limehouse mm -hmm. school i'd be happy to answer any inquiries you you may have sir are there any other people in the room, like other than, I guess, children? I mean, there's a there's a whole big mess of children everywhere. Yeah, mm. uh, yeah. <laughs> he makes a face. But um, I think actually, I would like to use my move here for the oh, first time. Oh, give it, give it. I'll read it. It says, at any time, you can declare that a side character is secretly one of your worshippers. Please describe how Mr. Chesterfield subtly or not so subtly debases himself before you in the scene and then scar your reflection. What does he do to show that he's actually your worshiper? I think that he looks around and I hold out my hand like this and he, he doesn't, he doesn't touch my skin, but he does kiss the ring. Hmm. And I think that probably gets like a, a a strange look from some of the kids and the Not other, subtle. the other teachers, and he whispers really quietly. He says, "My lord, I didn't want to, I didn't want to say everything that I knew, but but what, 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 why have you why have you chosen to grace me with your presence here in in this place, which is entirely unworthy of you?" Oh. Of course, I know, darling. I just have, well, I have something for you, and I hope you have something for me. I have, I have everything for you, my lord. You have, you have, but to, you have, but to, to ask, and I shall. Oh, well, what, what would you have of me? And he reaches into his his pocket, and um, like one of these inner coat pockets, and very subtly, like palms over a little bit, like not really showing it off and they're the gilded thumb screws <laughs> he, for your devotion he says he looks at them like quizzically i think he doesn't really know what they are and he's like what what magnificent artifacts these are my lord i what 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 treasures uh, surely these must have some sort of some sort of strange semi-divine significance connected to your personal myth. I am honored. Absolutely. And if you have a an office or a back room, I can show you how they work. Um well, uh, of course I am <laughs> I'm happy to 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 do a Anything you want. Indeed, let's check in with the move. It says, yeah. whenever you make a gift of something from your personal quarters to a worshiper, which you've just done, they will do exactly as you say. No questions asked, up to and including destroying themselves. If you demand information from them, it may come in the form of a clue at my discretion. Yeah. And I am much more interested in getting a clue from them. I don't think I need Mr. Chesterfield to destroy himself. I think he's got it bad enough already. He's, he's got, got it. Already. He's got it rough, man. Yeah. Uh, what do you ask him? So I think I uh, ask him to tell me exactly what he's seen skulking around here and what happened to the person that died here. Like, just give me the full deets, the entire story. Like, I'll sit him down if we have to, Show him how the <laughs> Jesus Christ, Tony. Um, show him how the uh, the thumb screws work while we talk. Uh, super casually, as if this is something I do every day. I think you're in his office, and he's having this convert. You're having this conversation with him, and you're showing him how they work, and he's doing his best to stay like attentive, but also like sort of worshipful, but also like 
not freak out because as he's learning that these are like torture devices and he's afraid you're going to use them on him. But then he also kind of thinks in the back of his mind, maybe he would like that. So he's, he's having a lot of conflicted feelings right now, Mr. Chesterfield, but he does reveal to you. Yes. Uh, he was there when they found the body of Charla Bell. Charla did work at the Limehouse school and there have been other strange things that have been happening in the days since. In particular, the children all found a really strange collection in the rafters or the upper levels of the Limehouse School. They found a collection of Bibles. Each of the Bibles, in each of the Bibles, the pages telling the story of Noah and the Ark were ripped out. Fascinating. Okay. I love that. And when you're all when you're done, he's um, he's kind of holding the thumb screws, and he says, um, "What, what would you, what would you like me to do with these?" Oh, feel free to use them on yourself or others. That's up to you. They're a gift. I think he looks down at one particularly unruly older kid and says, I'll bear that in mind, and slips them in his pocket. I hope I was able to be of some assistance to you. Oh, more than enough. You did lovely today, darling. And kind of does the thing he does with Langfisk where he doesn't quite touch him, but kind of like pats the air by his cheek and uh, just fucking turns heel and leaves without... a goodbye. <laughs> yeah, you have to you have to scar your reflection as well. So yes. be thinking about what that looks like, how the painting changes. Um, and I think we're probably going to get ready to head into our uh, to a little break, if that's okay. Uh, but before we do, I do want to get a quick sense of what Langfisk and Doctor Spectum are going to be doing next. I was going to ask if I could use a move, please, Jason. Which move? My person Friday. Oh. I was wondering if it would be okay with you for when Lord Grey leaves, there's a knock at the door of Mr. Chesterfield's office and Langfisk will be there. Oh, interesting, interesting, interesting. So let's read the, um, really quickly, uh, My Person Friday. It says, where are we at here? Uh, Once per session, you can appear in any scene at any time, ready for action. If there's an object or tool that would be helpful in the scene, you have it on hand, add it to your personal quarters. What are you hoping to accomplish here? Uh, I just want to follow up with Mr. Chesterfield. I want to make sure that he's been completely honest with the Lord and hasn't left anything out. Oh, interesting. I like it. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's go to, let me check in with Dr. Respectum. What are you going to do next? Um, I think there is, we, we do see like, there's a good, like we see a little montage. There's a good 10 minutes while I'm talking to Langfisk absentmindedly uh, that he has been gone for. Um, as I <laughs> I assume he is going back to, um, let's see, we've got somebody at the school. We've got somebody, I, we already went to the Opium Den. Um, what's the third location a body was found at? Is it the bar? Uh, the pub. The pub. Yeah. Um, I inspected the body at the pub. Let's still go to the pub. I'll, yeah, I think I'm headed to the pub. Um, it is very evident to our audience that I'm looking low. Like I am paying attention to dark, shadowy, like uh, side, like but as, as I get closer, um, like basement windows. Um, I am I am intentionally looking for something specific as I make my way to the pub. I love it. Um, well, with with all that, then uh, why don't we go ahead and take a quick five minute break um, so we can. Uh, I, I really want a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go hit an espresso. Um, yeah, exactly. And we will be back in just about five minutes to keep on playing The Between.
We are back. We are live, and we have made a couple little changes on some angles and some technology to get Vin's video uh, a little bit better, but we're going to dive back in to the between. Fantastic. So I really love this moment here, Langfisk. You just show up in Mr. Chesterfield's office. Lord Grey, we assume, is sort of like already left, maybe still nearby, but not in the office anymore. Um, what do you do? Yeah, I think there's just like a brisk knock on the door. Uh, Chesterfield opens the door and you just see Langfist. Good afternoon. When you, when you, when you look up, he looks up and he's like broken out into a cold sweat. Like he's loosened his tie. He says, oh, uh, uh, who, who are you? Seems like all you in a state there, mate. <clears throat> yes, well, um, I'm coming down with a fever, I think. You might oh. want to stay away so you don't catch it. Oh, no, no, I've got a strong immune system, my friend. I think I know what was the cause of that fever. Did you just have a visit from Lord Bastion Gray? Um, uh, no. Uh, Langfisk, the items, the item that I'm going to take from the scene are those thumb screws, uh, uh that I think are on the desk and just going to pick them up and look at them and go, so these aren't Lord Grey's thumb screws. No. Uh, I'm going to tell you something. Chesterfield, was it? No. Uh, yes. Yes. Good. You see, I don't like liars, Chesterfield. Liars are worse than, uh, well, they're worse than rats, you know? They, uh, they crawl into places, run down places, and they, they latch themselves onto hardworking people and make money off their backs, much like you're doing with these children here. Mr. Chesterfield, the Lord Grey has done a kindness to you, a, a service, allowing you to bask in their presence. You understand that, right? Yes. Were you completely honest with Lord Grey as I start slipping the thumb screws over his mm, thumbs? You can make the information move here. Um, and you have, because you have this item, let's see what it says. Uh, oh, you can add to your personal quarters and market for advantage if you want. Absolutely. Right. I'm going to absolutely do that. 3d6, take the two highest. That is a nine. He says, <clears throat> yes, yes, there's something I didn't tell Lord Grey. But you see, if I say they'll do terrible things to me. I'll tighten the thumb screws. The, it, the children. The children, the children. Lord Chesterfield, you shouldn't worry about the children. I'm going to do terrible things to you. I'm not going to torture you, though. It doesn't work, mate. Trust me, I've tried. You'll just say anything. But you don't understand. The children talk to it. They talk to it. I, I think it controls them. And here he will look over your shoulder his office has like a little kind of window looking out into the workhouse. And if you look back, you'll see that all of the children are standing stock still facing the office, looking in at you. 
I'm going to pick up. This. But your clue, though, is that the vampire can influence large groups of children. Goddamn village of the damned. It's a little village of the damned situation. Dr. Spectum. Um, traveling, it, it sounded like you were angling for something in particular when you said on, on your way to Limehouse. What did you have in mind? I, I'm i not. I'm going to the bar, but I, okay. I Dr. Spectum, it's, it's very, uh, like, Dr. Spectum, I think, is somebody who it's very obvious that they are always paying attention to something. It is usually just not what is right in front of them when it comes to living people. Um, at this point, it is very obvious that as, as aloof as they seem, they oftentimes are looking up or lost in thought. Mm. They are very much on the hunt for something. Um, and in their mind, this creature, this specimen, um, the last time they met it was under underground. So they are just aware that if, as they are, that they have entered into the realm of this thing, um, and they are looking for, I'm looking for the creature. I yeah. just happen to be going to the bar. I like it. I mean, the bar is, you know, it's all in Limehouse, right? Yeah. Um, I'll give you an information move with reason, um, to, to, to basically summarize what you might see on the way to Limehouse as you're walking, as you're going to the bar, um, or you might see in Limehouse. Uh, taking a look at your conditions, um, I don't think any of them actually apply, so you can roll with regular dice. That's a 10. Actually, it's an 11 with reason. Oh, nice. Very good. Um, I'll give you your clue in a moment. Rick Miller. Rick Miller, you and Abigail are, you're kind of having like a little afternoon friendly date thing. I'm not really sure. Everyone's being a little circumspect about what's actually going on here. I think that's intentional on both of your parts. I'm not completely sure yet. And, but as at one point, the two of you are sitting on a little bench, um, kind of sitting on a little bench and I think you're approached by someone who's walking along the the promenade. In fact, let's talk about the promenade a little bit. Well manicured lawns, neatly ordered flower beds, very ancient trees. Let's paint the scene, everyone. Name something truly beautiful along the promenade, something that stands out. from the grim, the grim London, uh, the otherwise grim London environment. I think there is a, an or like an ornamental statue carved from this like marble that glistens in the sun and there's creeping ivy moving over it. And it is of a, a small cherubic angel, just kind of chilling. I think uh, near the water, we can see uh, two women that were promenading with each other, talking about their lives and such. And at a moment where they think nobody's looking, you can see the two of them grasp pinkies thusly in a uh, chaste lover's embrace. Every bird in the vicinity is sinking. It is like an orchestra of nature and absolute bliss. Um, a number of brightly colored paper boats uh, gently make their way down the water. This person approaching the two of you, Mr. Miller, she's, let's see. Well, the first thing you're gonna see is a lot of blue uh, we'll just start with that. Um, a very, very beautiful older black woman, her hair done up very elaborately, even for this time of day. Um, beautiful sapphire gown and parasol. And 
most strikingly an enormous sapphire on her breastbone. This necklace, it in, in the afternoon sun, I mean, it, it's dazzling and it's fabulously valuable. <laughs> like just the kind of person who can walk around in public with that kind of, um, I don't know. I mean, this is like, this is like queen shit, right? But she's not the queen, <laughs> you know? And she, she approaches and she says, Miss Simpson, it's so nice to see you. And who is your charming companion? Um, Patrick Miller, miss, but that was called me Rick. Patrick Miller. And she goes to shake your hand. I'm Mrs. Brathwaite. The pleasure's all mine. Oh, no. I think the pleasure is entirely mine. You're American. How interesting. I can't imagine what gave it away. You know, it must be so nice to be American in a city like this. It's, well, you just sort of automatically stand out. The rest of us have to be so much more ostentatious to stick out in the crowd. I rather quite admire it, which is not to say that you don't have any inherent charms apart from your Americanness, Mr. Miller, that would catch the eye. And I feel like that was just a lot of words in like his direction. <laughs> He's still stuck in ostentatious. <laughs> oh, oh, I, I don't thank you. Oh, a wonderful woman as yourself wouldn't have to do much, if anything, <laughs> to grab someone's attention. Mm. Well, enough of this mutual flattery. Abigail, Ms. Simpson, I hope you will be on the dancing platform tonight. And Ms. Simpson nods, and she kind of pulls you a little closer. Mr. Miller, she says, yes, I will be. And she nods and she says, well, I'll be happy to see you both there. And she continues walking down the promenade. And just going to watch and make sure she is, as far as like human uh, hearing distance. I'm sorry, was it Bradwick Bradshaw? Just flew right past me. Brathwaite, Theodora Brathwaite. Do you not know who she is? Well, I suppose you wouldn't. You're not from around here. No, I don't. Um, again, no bells. Might as well be deaf at this point. Um, Theodore Brathwaite is an investor in Kremlin Gardens for a start, which is how I know her. And she also just happens to be the second richest woman in the British Empire, right after, you know, Mm -hmm. <sighs> quite an interesting story really in her younger days she was the the sort of notorious pirate queen of Barbuda she was just 16 years old terrorizing the British Navy the Royal Navy had a hell of a time catching her they finally did and apparently a young Princess Victoria was so enchanted by stories of the Pirate Queen, she interceded on Mrs. Brathwaite's behalf and won her her freedom. Very, very interesting. And ever since she's turned her, her skills and her ships to legitimate enterprise and to great effect. Let's see, that is fairly impressive. She's an impressive woman. Though I do fear she means to eventually buy us out completely in Cremorne Gardens. I'm not sure any of us are going to have a job much longer. I just hope that Father gets a good price for it. I'm not even sure why she's so interested. Maybe she just really loves dancing. And he pauses to not make another creature joke and just nods, understandingly giving her, like, her arm a soft pat and reassurance. Fantastic. Well, Lord Gray, where do you end up after you're done at the Limehouse School? Do you even go very far 
before Langfisk. I, I don't even know if you're aware of Langfisk being there. I don't think I'm aware of Langfisk being there. And it depends on how quick Langfisk does this uh, fun little interrogation, whether or not he, and whether he wants to catch up to me. Because I think I'm heading to like the, where uh, Dr. Respectum is, the bar. I don't know he's there, obviously. Mm. But I'm like, okay, that's fucking wild. I'm going to get some more information. And, uh, but I'm it's not, not it's in a not hurry. Much of a, it's not much of a, yeah, you can get to the bar pretty quickly from where you're at. Yeah, and I'm not in a hurry. So it depends yeah. on what Langfisk is. Uh, yeah, we'll see. I've got some ideas. Let's check in. Um, oh, did we lose Langfisk? Where did Tony go? Mm. Oh, no, no, no. I, I, whether Langfisk catches up to me and whether Knox is still there, both are. I don't know where Tony went. Tony's, mm. Tony's well, left us. <laughs> we'll check in and Dr. Spectrum in a minute. Oh, oh there he is. there's our friend. There's our doctor friend. There's Tony Cito. It was, it was birthday cake and candle time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there, that's more important than whatever nonsense. I was trying I'm to doing. time it with the break. We just didn't hit it quite right. <laughs> no, no worries. Well, I just want to find out really quickly. Um, I owe you a clue. So let me give you that before I can pick up with Mr. Langfisk or uh, Mr. Langfisk. What am I talking about? Langfisk. <laughs> Mr. Langfisk is my mother. <laughs> Trust me, I'm not a lord or a mister whatsoever. Just Langfisk is fine. Indeed. Um, I think as you are roaming around, uh, as you're roaming around Limehouse, getting ready to, um, head to the pub, you're going to notice something that I think somebody only with your particular analytical mind would pick up on, which is strange things. Patterns, things in threes, the third thing always missing. For example, you go down a little side street with three gas lamps, but one of them has had the frosted glass removed. You see a clock the number three, the number six, the number nine, and the number 12 have all been removed. You see, <laughs> this is a, you see a little kind of like, um, like a little like kids diorama or sign kind of thing near the Limehouse School with like, paintings of like fairy tales and things on it you know and there's a painting of the three blind mice but the third one's been scratched out <laughs> this is your clue the third thing in a series of three is missing i'm just curious what your thoughts are on that and what you do in response if anything or you just head straight to the pub um, I mean, I think it's fascinating. I think what we see is, um, like, we oftentimes see when Knox is doing diagnostic work, we see that staccato wrapping, right? I think what we see is, after the after the first two, um, it's a confirmed pattern. Um, and I stop and start to just go knock knock like anytime i can touch the thing if i can't quite touch it um like you'll see him just reach out and like there's a very clear way that he's processing but there is also there's almost a sense of this being a clear signal if he's being watched that i see you and i notice you there's almost a a sonar like quality as i'm 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 calling out to this this mm. vibrant specimen and trying to let it know that it is it is perceived in the world. I love this. I'm not sure you can make it to the pub because you're so wrapped up in this work. That Do tr that tracks for Knox. Like I yeah. like I 100 percent yeah. Do another information move. This time, however, with sensitivity. Oh, that's that's a one on the first die. That's a five. So that's that is a seven. Okay. Um 
I'll, I'll we'll, pick, we'll revisit the scene in a moment. Langfisk. Mr. Chesterfield is fucking terrified at this point. And all of the kids have started to slowly advance towards the office. They move like a phalanx, like rows of soldiers marching toward the office. I think I want the day move just to gauge your reaction and see how you react. What are you afraid is going to happen if you lose your nerve right now? I'm going to throw Chesterfield to these children. Oh, how interesting indeed. Uh, go ahead and roll with composure. Let's see how you hold up. Eleven. You're keeping it together. The kids are getting closer, though. What do you do? Mr. Chesterfield? I suggest you take this as a warning. You better treat these children better. Also apologize what I'm about to do to you employees. And Langfisk is gonna jump through the window and like body the first kid and just like start like causing a ruckus and hopefully they chase after him or something or like disperse them. Mm. And like <laughs> not try to like permanently injure them or anything like that but is doing like probably like smacks and stuff like that is mm. like and like just like spanks and like tossing them over to the side and everything and just being like get out of the way go get out of I here i think this is really intriguing um we have to veil harm to children but uh but i think we can manage it fine the kids i'd be more worried about them harming you frankly the kids they they like fight back with quite ruthless efficiency. They grab scissors, they grab knitting needles, they grab little, all the tools of their work and they just descend upon you. I think this is going to be the day move again, this time with vitality because of your messed up leg, I'm putting you at disadvantage. What are you afraid is gonna happen if you fail? Uh, we did fix the, we, the, I did. The oh, you cleared that. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. didn't clear it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, 2d6 plus vitality. What are you phrasing going to happen if you fail? I'm going to kill these kids. Oh, you I'm going like, to seriously injure them. I'm worried oh. that I'm going to let go. Like, Langfence is going to, like, lose it. Is going to lose control. That would have bad oh. repercussions, indeed. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Go ahead and roll yeah. vitality. Let's see how it goes. Okay, that's a nine. I think you are going to weather their blows. I'm going to give you puncture wounds and bruises as a condition. Amen. Amen. <laughs> but you will otherwise be able to escape this scrap. Lord Grey, you hear the commotion. What do you do? You're not too far gone. Okay, uh, question. Do I hear Langfisk say anything? Or is it just a general commotion? I don't know. Like, this, do, you, do you make do you it clear that you're there? Don't hear me. Uh, yeah, you probably hear, like, Vominos, children! Vominos, get out of here! Disperse! Get out of here, you cunts! Get out of oh. here! And, just, like, <laughs> and then probably, like, some smacks, and then, like, a and then like Langfist screaming out in pain, and then, like, and then, and then a smack, and then, like, and then a slam as like from the alleyway is like closing like a wooden fence door and then just like standing on the other side and you can hear like bangs on the other side of it. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Cause he was not going to go in if it was just the kids. That's not his fucking problem. But uh, he does turn around, whip around, <laughs> Langfisk. I think before you have an opportunity to even do that much lord gray i think you might have a problem of your own <sighs> do tell someone someone from the shadows two large burly guys descend upon you they are out of character. They're agents of Theodore Brathwaite. Oh, fuck. And so I'm invoking the sapphire. 
to put you at disadvantage. <laughs> yeah, baby. But I want the day move right now. What do you afraid is going to happen if you fail to resist their their attack? Um, that I'm going to be taking. Trying, they're clearly trying to grab you and take you. Okay, yeah, I'm. I'm afraid I'm going to be taken prisoner. And frankly, that I don't want to get put in like a cell of some ew, ew. <laughs> Very good. Uh, this is going to be with Vitality. Go ahead and roll with Disadvantage. Okay, 86, we... take the two lowest. All right. I don't remember what my Vitality is. i got to look at it. It's probably not high. Oh, it's a one. Okay. Do, do, do. Do, do. Okay. Oh, that's a seven. Okay. Okay. Um, you will escape, but I do think you get roughed up a little bit. Okay. Uh, <sighs> I think, and also I think you're you're gonna have to run away from the scene, and so you won't be able to follow up with Lang Fisk oh, and no. the kids. My poor but man. I, I have control of the scene technically, but I am, but I'm more interested in hearing what you do to defend yourself. So I think that he's not like a large man. Absolutely not. Like this is, and he's not someone who fights, but he does like. I think when they try to grab him, you see him like elbow them in the gut, like, and backhand him with like a handful of sharp rings and pretty much just, just fight like a cat until they, they let go and skitters away and almost feels bad about leaving Langfist, but he's like, nah, if anyone has it, he has it. Uh, go ahead and take a condition roughed up just from the way they handled you. And I think that that'll probably get pretty close to wrapping the day phase for the two of you. I want to check in with Dr. Spectum and Mr. Miller one more time. Mr. Miller, what do you do when you're done with this idol? Uh, this idol uh, hanging out with Abigail Simpson? I mean, it was so unexpected. Dead. I, I um I think he does go to the pier just to okay. watch the waters a little bit. I like that. At least he got a scan. So you can head out to the pier. Um to reach the pier, you have to actually walk out of the gates of Cremorne Gardens. This is technically not in Cremorne Gardens, but mm -hmm. if there is an actual fish man, this is probably where he comes from. Um so it's not a bad it's not a bad thing to con to think about. Um, I think I just want to, I want to talk about the pier and I also want to talk about Chain Walk, which is the street that abuts it. This, this street is, it's kind of like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of like, what is the modern day equivalent of this street? This street is like, Austin or Greenwich Village or something like that, right? Like it's 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 like it's a whole city of Portland. It's that kind of place, right? It's artists, <laughs> it's like it's like Victorian era, you know, like Bohemian and Bohemians, whatnot. yes, thank you. Like like Bohemians, they're probably drinking absinthe, like there's a whole it's a whole thing, right? You smell the quite strong smell of roasting coffee beans. There's the whistle of steamer ships in the distance, the hopelessly stupid giggling of young lovers. Um, let's paint the scene about this. This street along the harbor and just a few hundred feet from Cremorne Gardens will become the center of an artistic movement in London in just a few short years. What do we see right now that hints at this future? we see a woman in a brazier uh but long like long flowing dress smoking a cigarette uh and using the uh police illustrated uh magazine uh to plaster a paris this guy that's sitting like a statue um <clears throat> we see someone with um very non-functional, overly small lens spectacles that barely cover the iris of their eyes and are, and are incredibly dark, um, walking around providing uh, critical commentary uh, about um, every piece of art in sight. 
I think we see someone writing, like offering to write poems about the passersby, like for a small penance. And it's a short little poem that they'll write about you right there and they'll, they're handing it to people. Um, there are two artists sitting together talking. One is extremely like ruddy faced and teary as they get the most scathing critique of their life. I love it. Um, so what do you do? Uh, this really isn't his scene. Not that art makes him uncomfortable, but he's striding very quickly uh, through this street. What are you actually looking for? What are you hoping to accomplish by going down here? Um, I think initially, or the goal that he set in his head is to look for the creature or any like abnormal fish sizes. Mm. But I think what he actually does is just have a moment to just look at his reflection. Oh, Remind like himself that. that he's human. Oh, very good. I'm going to give you the information move with sensitivity. And I think as you're looking in the waters, the sun is reflected in the water twice. And so I'm going to invoke sons of another world and put you at disadvantage. Darn. Let me roll this extra dive in. That's a four. A four. <laughs> I think as you're looking, I'm just going to take the fiction, as you're looking in your reflection, you see the two suns, an optical illusion perhaps, but perhaps not. They're too far apart in the reflection for it to make any sense that there should be another one there. And you can feel that moment when the man in the sun mask was standing behind you, beckoning you to open your eyes and look through the mask. And you close your eyes instinctively, but then you can hear him whispering, open your eyes, look into the suns of another world. And when you open your eyes, I am now gonna go ahead and do the day move. I wanna know what you're afraid is gonna happen right now in this scene. It could be out of character fear. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm afraid he's going to lose his shit, like absolute ballistic terrified at this I, period in front of all these people. I think that's probably right. Go ahead and roll with, um, roll with composure this time. And because of, and because of the conditions, you've got two really bad ones that, for this, make it a disadvantage as well. All right. Okay. Um... Let's see. Yeah, that is a six. <laughs> I am going to um, <laughs> check back in with you in a moment. We'll decide if you want to bump that up in a moment. Um, Nox, I owe you a clue, right? Yes. What did you get on your die roll? Remind me. I got a seven. Okay. And I was thinking about bumping it up, but I also like that I'm pretty sure this is where I rolled with a complication last time, and I really like being being exposed to this thing potentially. So, I, you know what? I, here's what we're gonna do. In something of an echo of the last session, you see down below when you make that third you know you're doing that little thing trying to lure it out you see from a little gutter grate a stream of blood a stream of blood moving up from the grate the blood moves up in the air and then moves in a spiral a very similar shape to what you all had to deal with with the ghost. I, that is your clue. The spiral blood pattern is your clue. 
I want I want to trigger the night move here. I want to know what you're afraid of right now. What could go wrong here? How, what is the problem? Knox is implicitly a man even for the age of science. So even though that may be mixed with a healthy rational acceptance of things that he does not understand, the mirroring of this to the ghost experience and his him experiencing that choking really is pushing him this I'm afraid this will shatter my worldview. Like this will reshape the way he sees himself and his place in the world. Like this is a potentially mind breaking moment for him. I was going to say it's this. worse than that. It shatters your mind. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, roll with sensitivity. So that is a nine. I'm going to give you a condition, the spiral, but you will otherwise hold it together. I'm curious just what you do in the scene. How do you react? I, if it's okay, I almost think it's better if we don't see precisely how I react. I'm into that. Yeah. The next thing Knox is aware of he is coated in blood that is that is still reminiscent of that spiral pattern. Like at some point in some fugue, he just stepped into the middle of it. And we see him like for a moment, we see his eyes and breath cold at the moment of death last time. And as we see him exhale in this moment, a puff of like cold air comes out as he comes back and he is just standing in the middle of this blood field covered by it. Um, I feel like being covered in blood in the middle of Limehouse right now is not the best thing. Um, I'm going to additionally give you a conditioned person of interest. <laughs> oh, ramp it up, baby. Mm -hmm. All right, so I, what was the first condition? The spiral. The spiral. And then person of interest. That'll conclude your day phase. Um, I do want to wrap up with Rick, but I, but I just briefly would like a little moment back at Hargrave House with Langfisk and Lord Grey, if that's okay. Just a little quick kind of seeing the two of you reunited for the afternoon. How long does it take Langfisk to get back in comparison to Lord Grey, who uh, scurried, scurried his little ass back home? I think it's it's like about 10 minutes. Uh, I think, uh, where would where would Lord Grey go? Would Lord Grey go to the room or elsewhere? I think he goes to the room and you act like he's like uh, sitting on the couch with Mercutio, the, the hairless cat, and just like smoking a cocaine cigarette, maybe a little too fast, and is deep in thought as this cat just sort of like bothers bothers him. Yeah, I think um, Langfisk, not even expecting uh, you to be here. I think you hear Langfisk and just going like, shitty fucking children, the shitty fucking Chesterfield should have kept them all together. Just, oh, I hate this place. I hate this fucking city. And you can hear Langfisk's door open and then close. Amazing. I think yeah, there's there's a pause as he considers this, but he hears you say all these names and knows you were in there, and he's nosy as fuck. And so, still smoking, he leaves his room, chews the cat, and doesn't even knock on your door; just opens it, like he was uh, raised I, in a barn. 
the camera just sees Langfish opening uh, uh, Langfisk opening a small wooden box and putting the thumb screws inside of it and closing it. And the door opens. Uh, Langfisk goes, "Don't we know how to knock in this fucking house?" What happened? I was about to ask you that, my good man. What did happen? Uh, an unfortunate run-in with some prepubescent uh, near-do-wells. You got in a fight with children. I defended myself from a gang of children. I did not get into a fight with them. Why did a gang of children attack you? Do tell, because they seemed rather docile when I went in there about 10 minutes before you. It's not important. I think it has something to do with the investigation. I'm more concerned with what, what I, I, I thought we had taken care of your injuries, or, but you seem, did somebody lay a hand on you? Unfortunately, yes. Um, I'll remove I'm, their I'm hands. Fine. Darling, I know you will. I don't know who they were, though. And I think we might need to look into that. I don't think they were um, involved with a gang of children. They were rather large men. But, uh... I... I don't know who they were. But I think... They must be involved in this. They were hanging around the schoolhouse. I'll take care of it. What do you need? How can I take care of you? I need you to be more careful around, I suppose, gangs of children. I shall do that in the future. Thank you. And for the record, you don't have to follow me. As much as I love your company, I don't think I need a tail. I was hoping that you would not notice my presence, that you could move without fear of being followed, but I could keep an eye on you, but it seems that uh, my investigation interfered, and I apologize, it won't happen again. It's all right. Even if it does, I understand. But uh, do try to relax tonight. And he pulls out this gold case and offers you a cigarette. It is a cocaine cigarette. It's not a regular one. He doesn't have those. And you know this. But he offers it to you in a light. Indeed. Good boy. Mr. Miller. This is the consequence. Um, you don't need to worry about marking a Janus mask because, because basically you already have three conditions. And I'm going to give you a fourth condition, which means you're going to have to mark the Janus mask anyway. And marking the Janus mask is just going to be kind of ultimately the same result. So don't worry about that. Um, I am going to have you replace your creeped out condition because as you are looking at this double sun in the water, you realize it's not... It's not just, it's not a sun. The other one is not a sun. The sun is, the second one is the hidden moon. I'm gonna replace your creeped out condition with the hidden moon. You have to also mark Janus mask. And Uh, the hidden moon is going to be a big problem for the quickening, so <laughs> just know that <laughs> as well. <laughs> oh, no. So, uh, what are you going to mark on Janice Mess, though? Just, you don't have to do it now, but I'm just curious what you're looking at. Um, well, <clears throat> I need to find them on the... Is it a tab or... Oh, it's, actually... it's at the bottom of the, the sheet. Uh, if you scroll oh. down, the mask of the past, the mask of the future. Gotcha, gotcha. Mm -hmm. You can also mark the one that's on the threat too, if you don't want to mark one of those. 
Oh no. I'm moving around and I still don't see them. Oh, there they are. Sorry. My bad. Um anyway, be thinking on it. Um mm, that yes, will I'm... wrap our day phase. Let's go ahead and head over to the dusk. It's the dusk phase and we need to we need to roll the quickening. Um, also the mother, did you take the resurrectionists? I did Tony? take the resurrectionists, so I'll yeah, I'll determine what what Harley uh, winds up to. Oh yeah, um, good. Each dust phase you get to pick two things, so be thinking on that. Uh, let's do the quickening though. Rick Miller, you live with a curse that caused you to become monstrous uh possibly at the start of the dusk phase roll with composure or sensitivity your choice because of the quite special condition the hidden moon i'm putting you at double disadvantage you roll four dice and take the two lowest please <laughs> it was nice though and you guys i'm coming back as the vessel i gotta buy a whole other costume i can't believe this I'm foregoing my Hello Kitty D6 and I've never heard her double di oh god <laughs> that is a 6 I think you're probably the first person to ever roll double disadvantage in this game so let's go <laughs> uh, okay so here's the thing you're gonna wolf out which will be the retirement of your character unless you mark Janice Mask again to bump it up to a 7 See, I am known to like do stupid stuff like like let's go. no. Um gosh. I'm gonna take these two other dice. I'm gonna roll. I'm gonna leave it up to fate. Because oh, I think fate. fate is funny. Uh odds. We're done. Evens, we take another mask. <sighs> What's gonna happen? I don't know. <laughs> What did I say? Because I forgot already. <laughs> I forgot too. Um, I think it was <laughs> the ones it... that you roll is putting on a mask, and the ones that you didn't roll is you not putting on a mask. Uh, it was odds not putting on a mask, and evens yeah. putting on a mask. Yeah. Okay, it was a two. Okay, we're putting on a mask. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good Christ, Vin. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, very good. Um, so you have to mark Janice. You have two Janice masks now you have to cope with, but uh, okay. you are otherwise good. You would normally take the drained condition here, but I'm not going to do that since you had to put a mask on to avoid wolfing out. So um, All right. uh, you're, you're, because you already have three conditions and I, I think you're good to go for now. But and it's to mask of the past, or that's up to you. You can mark the mask of the past, you can mark the mask of revelry, you can mark uh, the mask of the future, any combination thereof. Okay. I'm definitely going to do um, the Darkened Threshold. Nice. Um, okay, love that one. And then I'll go look at the others, or maybe just the uh, first Mask of the Past. Yeah. I so mean, also feel free to take take advantage of the adventure sp or the, the threat specific masks also, too, so you're not just tearing up your sheet because those are going to. Oh, it didn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You won't. Unless you want to yeah. start telling your backstory, too. I mean, that's the other. Uh, that's the that's to me is the benefit of choosing. Mask of the past, really. <laughs> yeah. I'll, uh, I'll look at the other um, the, the threat mask, but I'm definitely doing the Darkened Threshold. Cause... Yeah. The Darkened Threshold will require you to narrate a scene in which you hurt an innocent because of your curse. So that has to happen probably tonight. Right. Maybe you're like barely keeping it under control and you go hurt someone by accident. Oh no. I love it. Okay. Uh what are the what are the resurrectionists up to tonight, Dr. Aspectum? Um, we're gonna send uh we're gonna send the resurrectionist out. They are going to dig up uh, a corpse that night. Okay, we love um, that. Um and I think um Given everything else going on with me, uh, we'll face no below backer complications for any criminal activities the grave robbers get up to that night. Fantastic. So what uh, when, when they dig up a body, what's the benefit to that? Uh, they would dig up a corpse that night during the dawn phase, acquire a body part for the child. Oh, nice. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, we might have a little scene at the start of the night phase as they go, as they're talking to you to get yeah. ready for that or something. But 
Um, love all that. Okay, great. Let's check in with our phase. So we need to talk about Hargrave House. And I think we're going to be tonight in the tr trophy room. I love the trophy room. I do too. That's my favorite spot in the house. There, Actually, that's not true. The music room is fun too. There were hunters living in Hargrave House before all of you. Trophies from their encounters with the supernatural can be found in the trophy room. Please describe one. I think that there is, sorry, Rick, the mounted head of a werewolf taxidermied. Uh, night move for for <laughs> for Mr. Miller. <laughs> no, but that's awfully that's awfully conspicuous. <laughs> um, I think there is a podium uh, that you see uh, two what look like separate pogo sticks that have shoes on the end of them, and there's a tag that says "Property of Jacks." Um, there is, um, a rough, uh, iron, uh, sarcophagus standing in the corner that is, uh, chained up and shakes, uh, from time to time. Interesting. Interesting. It looks like we lost Ben, but that's okay. We'll pick up, catch up with them later. Uh, let's talk about what's next in the phase. Okay. So at this point. Um, I need to figure out what you're all trying to do tonight. Um, now, the day phase belongs to you, but the night phase belongs to me. I may not follow your wishes in terms of what you want to do, but I am nevertheless curious to hear what you're interested in doing tonight. Um, Lord Gray, what do you think? Well, uh, I kind of want to, like, this is so abstract, but I want to look into, like, who the hell those dudes were by the by so like i might be doing the most ill-advised thing possible and going back to the limehouse district is what it's called yeah um uh, sure yeah that's good or whatever it's what that area that yeah. area uh at night oh so you're you think maybe you might be able to track them down yeah okay i like that very interesting indeed um hmm well then langfist what are you going to do uh, the Lord's not going by himself, and I'm going to bring some back up as well. Fantastic. Um, Dr. Spectum, what's your plan for the evening? I've I've had a bit of a day. Um, so I think I'm going to spend some time uh, working in the lab tonight. Oh, okay. Interesting. Hmm. It's always, it's always fun when a hunter stays behind in Hargrave House at night. It always like poses interesting challenges. At this point, if anybody has any Janus Mask prompts they want to resolve, please do. I do have one that I've I've not uh resolved from I think it's the the other one. It's the it's my second mask of the past. Go for so it. We can we can do that while while we uh well, we, before we do the night phase. All right, so uh, narrate a flashback to your young adulthood that shows the first time you met the artist who fell in love with you. So we're inside a grand ballroom. It's bustling with finely dressed people. And we see Bastion, as you have all seen him now, a young adult, in black, head to toe, it's clearly morning clothes, but he doesn't look particularly sad. He just looks a little tired. And now we see others are also in black. It looks like something between a, a wake and a ball. Most people are giving him polite space, but a young man moves through the crowd to approach him and they lock eyes before a word is said. And there's this magnetic tension that fills the air. And when he finally gets close, the young man 
sort of deferrently, uh, Mr. Oh, sorry, Lord, now, Lord Grey, my, my condolences about the late Lord Grey. Sebastian waves his hand like none needed. And there's a pause and a look of understanding on the artist's face, maybe even sympathy. Uh, before he can reply, though, Bastion just keeps talking. Uh, I don't believe we've met. Who are you again? Oh, um, I painted a portrait of Lord Grey before he passed and a few other people here, most of which are still standing, I promise. Um, Cecil. And he holds out his hand to shake Bastion's. Bastion looks down at his hand. What a beautiful name. And he takes it. And we pan out and watch him lead Cecil to an isolated corner of what we now see is Lord Grey's house. They talk. And they talk and lounge on these velvet cushions. And eventually, they move upstairs where we can't follow them. And the artist never takes his eyes off Bastion. Fantastic, thank you. Are there any other Janus masks that anybody wants to narrate or tell us about? Oh, Tony, we can't hear you. Vin, I know you were dealing with tech issues. Do you have uh, one you want to complete? We may not have Vin, that's okay if not. Um, it's, it's a good time, at least, <laughs> since it's in between phases. So, um, In that case, let's keep going. Uh, okay, so I'm going to introduce the Unseen. Now, I'll remind you all that the Unseen is your chance to create some really cool thematic and motif-like connections between scenes. You get experience at the end if you do that it's called an echo in the night we're going to be on line one my favorite unseen i'm curious if chat can guess what it is chat can you guess what my favorite unseen is let's see how long it takes him to get it maybe maybe they're not paying attention yep <laughs> man they got it straight away <laughs> very good the Tonight's unseen is Madame Morvane's boy tour, powdered princelings and delightful demigods, all agape for your amusement. Madame Morvane's. Her famous guidebook is a walking tour of all the best male sex workers in London. Ship Captain Jackson Flint Broadmoor has just come in for a three day port of call. The well worn guidebook clutched beneath his arm i'm gonna do prompt one prompt two will be mm, tony prompt three will be b and west you're gonna have prompt four If there are no other questions, we'll take a five minute break. We'll come back and do this night phase. Tony, we cannot. Sounds hear. good. We'll be back in just a few moments.
Now chat can see behind the curtain. I mean, there's a level at which is part of it's got to be like using Riverside also too. Like, I mean, I I can't, you know, like I can't imagine that it's not. Oh, if I'm gonna do this, I should actually make it so it works the right way. Hold on. No, I know. I have to. I have okay. to. Okay. I, I wanted to make no sure everyone. Knew, I just turned y'all's audio blind. on so that the chat okay. could be part of it. But they couldn't hear you before. They could just hear me so that they. Acknowledging, I'm just moving, moving people into the right spots. Um, playing Fisk. Wait, no, that can't be right. Lord Gray. That one. That should be there. Bye. Wrestling commentator Jim Ross, good old JR, used to be a a former fan. He's he's retiring after this season, which which is good because it, it, you can only take so much of a guy that you respect from down there. You know, I won't be telling my jokes like like this. Yeah.
And we are back. Uh, Vin is working on some technical stuff on their end uh, and will hopefully be back with us in just one moment. But Jason, why don't you take the rest of us back into the between? Indeed, indeed. <sighs> Madame Morvane's Boy Tour. Captain Broadmoor's first stop is the boudoir of Prince Louis, one of the more famed and in demand of the young men, Madame Morvane details in her guide. And Madame Morvane's description in the guide can't compare at all to seeing it in the flesh. Prince Louis' boudoir, he is powdered, soft, covered in yards of satin and lace. He invites Captain Broadmoor into his room. The room is, has like very beautiful floral brocade curtains in soft shades of pink and lavender and yellow. There is a woman's makeup vanity there with various products laid out on it. The bed is this canopied affair, the sort of thing that like a princess might sleep in, right? Prince Louis himself has, as noted, a very soft, distinctly femme kind of presentation, wearing a corset and jewelry, silk stockings. But his interaction with Captain Broadmoor is hardly soft and delicate. Captain Broadmoor quickly finds himself on the ground, being stepped on by Prince Louis, indeed being choked by the neck until he nearly passes out. And when it's all over, Captain Broadmoor is not even sure if he has the energy to finish his tour. I guess we'll see. Back at Hargrave House, a character who couldn't be more different from Prince Louis is our dear resurrectionist. What's his name? Harley White. Harley White, wearing dingy workman's clothes. He's got cracked teeth. He smells of grave dirt and tobacco. He's got a couple of fellows who are even worse shaped than him. And they keep like walking around Hargrave House, like picking things up, Dr. Respectum, like just picking things up and looking at them, like they have any business doing that. Um, and Harley says, <clears throat> right, doctor. So what's what sort of business are we getting up to tonight then? Well, I won't, I won't be able to to join you this evening, gentlemen, but I do uh, I do have a few uh, errands for you. I, I would encourage you to be especially considerate tonight. People are paying close attention to what's happening with certain bodies, but um, there is, and I'm trying to think, I inspected one of the bodies, but there were, we do know of a number of bodies that have recently hit the graveyard. Um, who were two of the other, what was one of the other bodies that we didn't look at, Jason? Um, oh, of the victims of For the, the Limehouse lurker? lurker, yeah. Oh, uh, well, you checked out the, the sailor. Sa the sailor, right? Yeah. So there's the uh, there's the young woman, Charla Bell, and then there's, uh, well, there's a, a male sex worker, Soft Jimmy. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to indicate the, um, uh, the public pup berry, like public burial site, uh, like the pauper's grave yeah. that soft Jimmy was probably 
uh, placed into. Now, Dr. Spectum, I must say I am most disappointed, most disappointed indeed by how this transaction is starting off. You want me to go find a specific body? You don't want to leave the matter in my hands, my judgment? I mean, you... My professional grave-digging judgment? Uh, I... I Doctor, am... Spectum, no one understands the quality and integrity of a corpse more than me. My good man. I can find you one that's still got all of its teeth, one that the eyes haven't liquefied yet, one that are not yet filled up with the, with the death gas. Oh, you don't want the death gas. You are most right. I do not want the death gas. And it, it how foolish of me to think. I suppose what I should do next time, Dr. Spectum, is I should bring you a, a checklist, perhaps, a form. That way you can just mark down what sort of corpse you want. Oh, get me a blonde one. Six foot tall. Do you, do you have a six foot tall blonde? All their fingers. And so forth. With all their fingers? The helpers are the helpers are like dropping shit and they're like <laughs> stumbling over things. <laughs> he occasionally yells at them. Right, right, right. Just tell me where your body is. <laughs> I give him the information. Where's it being buried? Limehouse. Great. Yeah. He's got it. Uh, which one do you actually want though? Soft Jimmy or Charlo? Sh- Soft Jimmy. Okay. Fantastic. Let's pick up with. Langfisk and Lord Grey. Let's paint the scene, everyone, as Langfisk and Lord Grey arrive in Limehouse, Limehouse by night. Um, you know, East London, rough part of town. How is Limehouse visibly more dangerous at night than it is in the day? I think it's not usually well lit in general, but this is astoundingly poorly lit. There are no lamp lighters that go here. Everything is cast in these really deep shadows. There are gangs of youths roaming the streets with pocket knives and cigarettes. Yeah, I imagine you have a different perspective on this Langfist than everyone else does. <laughs> Was that everyone? Tony still oh, needs sorry. to contribute My, to our terrible. I, I totally lost the plot there for a second. Oh, how are God you? How, how would the streets look more, look more dangerous at night? Oh, um, giant spiral shaped blood splatter. Uh, the um, um, it's it's far more quiet than you would anticipate. Um, there's a there's a heaviness that settled in. Um, and even even soft sounds uh, on the streets seem to echo slightly more than they should. Very nice, very nice. We'll just leave it there and go back to Captain Broadmoor's excursion. Tony, the next stop is Anthony the Adonis, whose body is rubbed with golden powder. How do we know Anthony is dying of consumption? Um, as the... The it starts off um, dark, um, and then a p- kind of pinprick of light uh, erupts briefly before a vivid spotlight um, shines onto a a small stage in a window, and we see Anthony uh, poised briefly in a classic Grecian scene, body uh, covered with golden powder, um, as he moves slowly from one position to the next, pausing so subtly that it's almost hard to catch any sort of movement except for the gold powder on his body seems to be pooling slightly. First, 
and the concave of his shoulder then rippling over what looks at first like worked and intentional musculature until you notice that there's not not quite even enough fat on the rib cage to slow down this golden trickle of sweat mixed with this gold powder. It pauses in the hip cavity just long enough, and suddenly the briefest cough, an eruption of golden powder into the air. You watch as he quickly and and fluidly reaches out more movement than we've seen so far and knocks something red over the light that's shining onto him to mask the trickle of blood down onto the gold powder, mixing with split, pooling over his body before the curtain gently closes and we hear muffled, deep coughing. Harley, Harley and the boys, uh, Harley and the boys, um, they leave Dr. Spectum. What do you do once they're gone? You got the house to yourself. I, I go up to visit the child. I have a, I have a, a few things I need to share with it, um, to discuss with it. Um, and I have a heart that needs to be put into place. Oh, do you want, do you want like a fever dream thing where the body talks back? Cause I'll play the body. I don't care. I feel like or we played, we played like... some vocalization of the flesh terrarium in the body last time. So I, I, I do like just kind of leaning into I'll this just make some noises. Yeah. We're, we're not <laughs> quite sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just make some noises. That'll be fun. Um, I think as you're getting ready to do this though, you hear downstairs ring, 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 ring. Langfisk! Uh, you gotta go all all the way down from the clock tower, right? Yeah, I I I think I'm like at the you know I'm I'm at least two stories up, and I'm I'm more than halfway there, and I I make my way back down. Someone's ringing the door. Hold on. Yes, who is it? When you open the door. It's one of the grave diggers. Harley and the other one, they're who knows where they're at. They're they're gone already. But it's just, it's but it's it's the third one. The quiet one. The one that didn't say much. He's very tall, kind of bean pole tall. His Adam's apple kind of like sticks out almost kind of violently. And he he's just staring at you for a moment. A good cup of coffee will fix that right up. I forgot me shovel. Hmm. And? I need to get me shovel. Okay. I mean, do you, do you, do you not know the way? He walks in to go get his shovel. He did indeed leave his shovel. It's leaning against the door frame. But he doesn't walk back out. He just stands there with the shovel. So he's looking in the corner like he sees something in the corner. Like something's caught his attention. But you don't see anything. But he's looking at something. And My he keeps like leaning in closer. Like he's trying to see what is in the corner. My good sir, is there... Is there something you need help with? Uh, um, nope. And he turns and leaves to rejoin, to catch up with Harley and his friend. <sighs> And he leaves. 
What do you do? I I close the door and start trying to make my way up again. Lord Grey, what's your approach here? How are you going to try to backtrack where these guys came from? Well, I know where I was when they assailed me. And frankly, it's it's just... Um, he's pissed, honestly. He didn't come with a plan other than to... to, to because he's, he's just... He has like a personal vendetta because they touched him without permission and... He wants to make good on Langfisk's promise, uh, his offer to cut off the hands. And um, so we got to find him to do that. And so he's going back to where they were. And maybe he'll ask some of the terrible little children around. If I think as you're doing anything. that, you see that carriage, that extravagant carriage that the oh. sapphire woman rides around in approaching. It comes to a stop, and the woman, Mrs. Brathwaite, we now know her name is, she opens up the little curtain and she says, Lord Grey. Hello. We haven't had a chance to be properly introduced. My name is Theodore Brathwaite. Pleasure. Uh, I would introduce myself, but it seems you already know who I am. How could anyone not know the incomparable Lord Bastion Gray and Co? Oh, yes, this is my man, Langfisk. Hmm. I suppose you're here looking for those fellows who tried to grab you earlier today. I am very sorry. They, they were in my employ. I was hoping that they would whisk you away to my country home so that I could personally invite you to a celebration. Oh, well, that is just lovely, but Miss... Uh, Mrs. Brathwaite. Mrs. Brathwaite. I can read, and I don't appreciate being whisked. <laughs> Oh, Lord Grey, I apologize for my brusque methods, but perhaps you'd like to join me now. And she opens the carriage door. I have to ask now, who is Langfisk brought with us? Yeah, what's going on with Langfisk? Yeah, well, who, who did you bring with us to do this? <laughs> what are you doing, Langfisk? Yeah. Uh, there is a move that I have that I've used before that's called the Hargrave House of Formals. Yeah. Uh, and I am bringing along barrel staves. <laughs> well, he's barrel a hooligan. Barrel staves. Big boy. Oh my gosh. Amazing. So, um, I think Theodora looks at barrel staves, who is a big, big man, right? Wide. So named because of his size. And, you know, wide as barrel and she says we don't have room in the carriage for everyone why don't we reschedule this and he reaches into his coat that is this pink green and gold brocade it is this lavish coat now he's like really fancy because he's a fucking idiot and he pulls out a calling card uh that's his and offers it to her through the window I'll take it and offer it to her before you can even offer it. Astounding. You don't hand stuff to people. <laughs> Astounding. Back That's what I'm there for. Madame Morvane's back at the tour. B. Gianni, an Italian temple, olive skinned, breathtaking. How do we know Gianni is having the time of his life? They're always good at pretending they're having the time of their lives. It's part of their job. Uh, and. It's no different when Captain Broadmoor walks in, but there is this glimmer in Gianni's eyes that is genuine joy when he sees a already slightly exhausted, gold-dusted uh, Captain Broadmoor. And 
he beckons him closer and puts a hand on his generous shoulder. And Captain Broadmore starts talking to Gianni like he would any other person that he's not hired as as entertainment. And we don't hear it, but it looks like Gianni's laughing at a joke he told. And he brings him in to this beautiful Grecian curtained bed and the curtain closes and we see the shadow of Gianni pulling uh, Captain Broadmoor down into a kiss. Dr. Spectrum, you don't get far up the stairs before you hear ring, 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 ring. Ring, ring. You're muted, Tony. Turn around. Head to the door. I look I look out to see who it is this time. It's the it's the tall grave digger again. And he says, I dropped my handkerchief over there. Grave digging's dirty work. He did, in fact, drop his handkerchief. You can see it grimy on the floor about where he was standing. I'll go and pick it up. <laughs> and I open the door. And I toss it at him. And I close the door. Then what? Let's try to go back up the stairs. You get a one, two, three three steps up the stairs before you hear ring, 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 ring. I just, I take note of what may have, may be in here that belongs to this gentleman in the foyer and surrounding area. Nothing as far as you can tell. <sighs> Did you forget your manners? Do you know what time of night it is? Do you open the door? <laughs> I, I just say it loud enough to be heard on the other side. Ring, 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 ring. Without looking, I open the door. There's no one standing in front of the door. You just see Belgrade Square. However... There is blood dripping down onto the front stoop of the house. Drip, 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 drip. Lord Grey, Mrs. Brathwaite says, Lord Grey, let me paint a picture for you. Cremorne Gardens, the fabulous dancing platform filled to capacity with thousands of dancers dancing reels and waltzes and all manner of fantastic fantastic dances people are dressed in their finery and i make my entrance in this exquisite blue gown it is exquisite magnificent sapphire and the most beautiful man in London on my arm. Everyone turns to look at this dazzling pair. They are completely awestruck. They can't imagine, they can't think of the last time they saw a duo so radiant. Their adulation rolls off of them in waves. You can feel the love. You can feel the admiration. You can feel the very near worship radiating off of them. And when 
you take the dance floor with me, all eyes focus on us. Everyone's breath held, completely frozen in anticipation. <laughs> Don't you want to experience that with me tonight, Lord Grey? You paint a beautiful picture, ma'am. You really do. And he looks over at Langfisk. And he looks over at this beautiful woman. And looks into the carriage. It's very uh, well appointed. Yes. I'm sure that... Uh, We could go. We don't have to bring this, uh, whoever this is. And he, he looks at like, like he has not learned this man's name. He's like, I'm sure he has other things to attend to. Langfisk, you can sit in the front with my man. How about this? Oh. My lord wants to go and have an evening with you. Hmm. Me and my good fellow here, there's work to be done. Hmm. I'll tell you this, uh, Miss Braithwaite, was it? Yes. Those two gentlemen that you had lay hands on my lord. I'll deliver them to you. Uh, too sweet. And I'll be very, very gentle with them. I need a, a hand with them something you can take as many hands from them as you like now lord gray please join me yes and before he does he does actually reach over to you langfisk and touch your hand with his the top of it this isn't the first time he's done it but it's very rare he says have fun tonight my lord and then he gets in the carriage with this complete stranger. Mm -hmm. Our last stop for Captain Broadmoor is Thomas, a rather plain young man, barely a man, who is clean and able. How do we know Thomas is doing this out of desperation? I think they have uh, Thomas on crowd work for this evening. Um, not doing any kind of um, showing, but we see Thomas is uh, working the John, so to speak, making sure, seeing if they have anything that they need, uh, if they uh, have anything extra that they want. Um, and I think ever so gently we see, uh, oh, you look so tired, sir. You look so tired. And you know what, Perky, right up. Uh, why don't I have a cup of coffee come around for you? Maybe we can have a nice chat and a conversation. As we see Thomas is whispering in close to these different gentlemen's ear, uh, and we can see his nimble fingers reaching into pockets and pulling out pocketbooks. Uh, we see him come by, and we see a gentleman with a green and it, it, green, like an extravagant kind of green brocade and everything. And and Thomas puts his hands on his shoulders and then down the chest and leans down and goes, you look absolutely ravishing tonight, sir. Is there anything that I can get you? And while he's listening, just another nimble finger, just grabbing a pocket watch. All this culminates into him working and making a nice little collection, but it's not enough. Uh, Thomas, it's never enough for Thomas because there's always bills that need to be paid. There's food that needs to be bought. There's family back home. And so eventually we see Thomas uh, after the show um, waiting in an alleyway as one of the uh, enjoyers of the evening's entertainment uh, leaves the establishment, makes his way out, whistling a tune. And then we see Thomas say, Oi, mister, uh, you drop this inside. And then immediately a blackjack is out and strikes the man in the face. And makes quick work of mugging him and leaving him there in the gutter. Dr. Aspectum, you can't see what it is because it's floating above the doorway, but there's something up there. 
dripping blood. What do you do? There's a an quizzical, cold, analytical look kind of overtakes the doctor's eyes. As all of a sudden, drip, 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 and we see his hand reach out and catch the third drop. And then drip, drip, he reaches out and catches the third drop again. And keeps on reaching out, catching the third drop. Not looking up at whatever is causing this but just reaching out and taking every third drop until the blood pools deeply in his hand. I love it. Um, let's memorialize this with a condition. <laughs> but I have so many conditions. Um, you can swap those were her favorite with the third drip. The third drip. And also, please, Mark Jonas mask. Yeah, I guess so. Um, from Lord Grey and Blankfisk, I just want a little narration from each of you of what the rest of your night looks like. Lord Grey, how does it go on the dancing platform at Cremor Gardens? An absolute dream. As long as my dance partner doesn't try anything uh, that is trying to cause me bodily harm. Um, I have a fabulous time. It is just astound. She's, she's quick witted. She's good to talk to and she's a good dancer. And I think he, he's very aware that she's dangerous, but that just makes it more delicious. We see the two gentlemen that roughed up Lord Grey appear at the front door of Hargrave House. Uh, when we see Knox has probably done a little bit of cleaning up and is finally making his way back upstairs. And there's a moment where they're about to hit the doorbell again. Um, but the camera cuts inside to Knox and it doesn't ring. Uh, because behind them, both barrel staves, this absolute unit of a man, and uh, Langfisk have bagged these two gentlemen over the head in which the camera goes black. Uh, and then the bags are removed uh, in a very like Tarantino Guy Ritchie-esque shot where it's from their perspective. And we see Langfisk and Beryl Staves standing over them. Uh, and Beryl Staves is cracking his knuckles and smiling. And we see Langfisk uh, holding up a meat cleaver and looking at it and goes, you gentlemen, Mates, you really got to find a different line of work. This is just not cut out for you. I mean, of all the places you could be tonight, you end up here in the cellar with us two. Barrel, be a good chap. Go ahead and hold them. Fellas, you don't want to move. I haven't done this before, and I, I reckon it's going to get pretty, mess pretty messy. Uh, and the camera moves from behind, and we hear chops and screams. Uh, and then uh, with another chop, the camera cuts back, and we see those two gentlemen being led out of the cellar of Hargrave House. And they have packing salt bags wrapped around their hands to make sure that they don't bleed out. And they are wincing in pain, and Beryl is, like, leading them away. Uh, and we see um, back in the cellar, uh, Langfisk has two boxes uh, and some green ribbon uh, and is tying uh, them up together almost like two little like um, just like ornaments that you would hang together uh, uh, like like truck nuts if you will uh, but for hands and uh, putting them in these like green velvet uh, bottom boxes uh, and putting them for display and then ties up uh, the box with the ribbon and then leaves the boxes at the vanity of uh, Lord Grey. And you can see there's a little bit of blood dripping from the corner of one of the boxes. Peak romance. That concludes the night phase. Let's go over to the dawn. Um, 
let's go straight to Dawn questions then. Uh, let's see what we got here. Uh, no one's getting credit for the first two yet tonight um, because we did not answer a capital Q question or resolve a threat. However, um, Langfist, did you experience an echo in the night? I would say so. <laughs> I did. I did. Indeed, you did. Uh, let's see. Dr. Spectum, did you? Oh, yeah. The pooling of blood was... Uh... Ah, very good. That's a good one. Uh, Lord Grey. I tried to with the same pattern on my outfit as the uh, as Prince Louis, oh, I believe. Yeah, 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 I, caught yeah, that. yeah. Like, I caught it. Yeah, yes. I caught it at the moment. Yeah, it was good. Um, fantastic. Thank you. Let's keep going here. Langfisk, did you engage in a petty reprisal of someone who angered your employer? Uh, we'll leave petty uh, relative here, relatively speaking. I'll give you credit for that. Did you ensure your employer got credit for your triumphs? Yes, you did. You specifically called that out. That was a good one. Uh, Dr. Spectum, did you dismiss the possibility of a supernatural explanation despite everything you've experienced? You kind of did with the spiral. You were trying to. I Yeah, I, I think he, like I said, he still is resisting it yeah. and dismissing it as more so. This is a thing I didn't know. If he had, if he had lost that one, I would say no. Um, but I also do think there is a... I think it's romantic, but um, I think oh, we're seeing question. an emotional attachment to to this child and whatever is happening to him, uh, also mm. to this breaking his life. Oh, to, to lurk her, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I like that. Yeah, it says, did you secretly engage in romantic or emotional behavior at odds? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, I think yeah. that. I think this. I think this. Whatever's going on with the lurker, I think it's really interesting, and it's going to be extra interesting whenever you all answer the question about whether it's young or old i think we're going to know a lot more whenever that gets answered uh fantastic okay so you got all those lord gray did you express a clear preference for the beautiful over the mundane yes you did did you appear in london society wearing risque or avant-garde fashion i'm not sure i it was dramatic enough to count uh this this go around yeah maybe not um fantastic so with one of your xps you can unmark your track um, and get an advancement. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Let's keep going here. Um, I don't need you to narrate the thing yet, uh, Tony, but I am curious what body part you're going to eventually get delivered by the Resurrectionist. Uh, I think, let's see. I think eyes. Nice. I think we'll save the flashback for that for the top of the next session, as well as any um, unresolved Janus mask prompts. We'll save those for the top of next session and go straight to stars and wishes. What a session. Um, <laughs> stars are things you enjoyed. Wishes are things you hope to see next time. I'll take stars and wishes from chat as well. I'll try to watch it and call them out as they happen. Um, who wants to uh, go first? I can. Uh, I'm just, I always want to go first because I'm always just super excited about everything everyone does all the time because everyone's fabulous. And um, holy shit, everyone was in rare form tonight in just like a really fun way. Oh my gosh. Uh, I'm going to star Vin. I know, I know he's not here, but I want to star Vin for when you're re watching this and for everyone else. The romance, like the subtle romance with like, the what was her name abigail abigail yeah i was having abigail, a lot of fun with that I was that was a lot super of fun with that. yes i can tell that i loved it so much <laughs> and a little bit of flirting with mm -hmm. our uh lady in sapphire like there's all this like we got the full range of intimate expression yes. between characters today <laughs> we did we really yeah, we, did, we did and, the whole thing. Uh, yeah. oh my gosh yes and the sort of like self-reflection like choosing to look at yourself in the like in the pond like the or the the lake that was beautiful uh yeah this is star for ben for double disadvantage is also oh, very yeah. good double disadvantage and a star yeah. for rolling a dice to decide whether you're gonna retire your character that was pretty, that was pretty bold. <gasps> that was bold. gave me a gray hair um and jason been great though I'd i know yeah, right I that would have been so really so fun. spicy yeah. oh my gosh jason stars for uh all of this, oh my gosh, I love your NPCs. So dramatic. The way you handle clues is really fun. Um, deciding to 
to have like the, the the way you did like the night scene with Knox. The the comedic timing was impeccable. Um, just absolutely impeccable. I just was doing the timing. A three thing too, it remember? was exactly. Yeah. Oh, me and Wes picked that so up. Good. The three thing was a good. Oh, good. Oh my gosh, Knox, your decisions with the lurker are so delicious. Like every single time, the catching the blood on every third drop, I was losing it. That's so good. I want you to make friends with this little vampire. Like that's so fun. Jesus Christ. Uh, West Langfist you, using my man Friday to be incredibly petty instead of like any other mechanical advantage. You got a clue from it, but that was a wild choice and I loved it. It was hilarious. It was just so good. It was very, very funny. And yeah, 10 out of 10, no notes. Absolutely hilarious that you fought a bunch of orphans. Um, good job. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Yes, just good job, everyone tonight. That was delightful. Everyone just, oh my god! I'll, I'll, I'm gonna call it some stars from chat real quick. Uh, Amanda gave a star uh, for the double disadvantage thing. That was a lot of fun. I agree. I, I, I noticed when I did it, somebody in the chat was like, "Can you even do that?" <laughs> yes, you can. Um, and well, I did in the rules. No, technically not, but who cares? Um, let's see. Let's see. Oh, uh, star for oh, star for Tony for that monologue. Yeah, that was really, really good. That was my that was probably my biggest star of the night. I was really, really like I thought I knocked it out of the park with my boy tour thing, but I thought yours was even better. Oh, thank it was you. really good. Um, we also have a star for B for just going on a date and not doing any work. Uh that's that's basically what the what the American did too. <laughs> sort of throw that out there. Um, yeah, um, star to length is for orphan punching. Very good, very good. Okay, um, who else wants to go next? Um, Billy, on that, Jason, I, I also love, like, I love the intentional or just perfect timing of, uh, you have, you, Langfist has used his one secession move to be near him, and then now, outside, the two burly men will appear and rough up your employee. It was like, yes, absolutely, you can use that one secession move to do this really cool narrative thing. Also, now I'm going to beat up your boss. That That is, I don't know if this is like advanced keeper stuff or whatever, or just advanced GM stuff, but I always look for opportunities like that. Whenever yeah, oh. like anyone spends their thing or does their thing, I'm like, oh, great, I'm going to... I, I had very right little doubt there. it was not intentional, but I just, yeah, I wanted to call it out because I noticed it was very, very good um uh i all the boy toys like we haven't had you you've done paint the scenes but this is the first time we've had you step in and do um Nonsense, one of yeah. the it was it was very good um and i i yeah. like i think usually when we have played there have been a couple other times you did but i was it was really good and, and like hearing you say it was your favorite one and then watching you pour yourself into that was like really really great um i uh i'll also say like i was not sure whether it was a fever dream or not at any point during my encounters with this weird guy. Right. Like it was I, like, as a player, I was like, if Jason's like, there's I was, nothing. I was playing that character and I felt weird. I was like, I was like, I don't know what's going on, but I'm just going for it. Yeah. This, it was such it was, a good moment of like, for it. Yeah. of stepping out. And I, I like, I always love that when, cause I, I'm a hundred percent the kind of player who's like, I'm going to lean into this weird shit and do weird and you you rewarding that with yeah let me like just beat the shit out of your character <laughs> with conditions is always really enjoyable it's like one of my favorite things about the between is that is the resonance that can come up there um uh west just great as always which isn't like specific feedback but i also i loved the like conflict is hard between players um and the way during that uh that vulnerable move scene that you leaned into that was like the perfect line of exactly what your character should have been done. What happens when you're comfortable at the table portraying aggression between characters. And you also didn't like create a ruinous moment between the two of us. It was just very clear. It was like just so perfect in the way. I love this take on effect totem. Like, uh, sorry to interrupt, but no, like, I love this take on effect totem, like star for that. It, it's, I've I've had I don't know in all the times I've run the between I've probably had the experience with like I don't know twenty different fact totems in total or something like that, and I've never seen a fact totem like this like this like kind of like um, 
menacing, like almost like henchman guy, um, and like uh, and like a level of like psychotic devotion. Like like it really has like um, it's got like I don't know like like Guy Ritchie movie vibes or like you know it's like it's got vibes like that you know um, and uh, uh, or like. Um, um, like Elmore Leonard vibes. It's got like vibes like that, right? And like, it's it's super cool. I'm really, really into it. Um, and it feels so appropriate for a London-based setting, yeah. right? You know, so. I feel like um, very Guy Ritchie's take on Green Hornet relationship. Yeah, 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 kind of, yeah it like, really is. It, yeah. it really has that kind of feeling, right? Yeah, it's 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 cool. I'm super into it. Uh, and be like, getting getting the reveal of of your masterpiece, that whole scene, like, was was absolutely great. Um, my I, was, I mean, when we're doing start, start it was great to have been on in in good video for a minute. My wish for next week is that we have all the tech issues worked out, which I'm sure is a lot of ours. Uh, yeah, uh, I want to give a uh, star then when you watch this. Uh, uh, the one time I ran the between for Vin and another group of people, and Vin played the factotum for the Martian. And there was a moment where we were doing the coven and there's this party happening. Uh, and the fact totem wanders off by herself uh, and ends up in a room with a bunch of people in bird masks having an orgy. Uh, and Vin rolls a failure and I describe Vin's character being susumed by a group of birds, like being fed to them and everything like that. Vin did the big swing of saying, I'm not putting on a mask. That's actually the end of this character. Cause like the character had very like bird, like relate, like kind of like coding for him. And so I'm always like, Vin is always there to make like the big swing and be like, fuck it. My character dies. Let me play a new one. And so like I star for you to not do that <laughs> because I like this character. And I want to see more of this character. I want to see more of you as the American, but also like star for you for like be willing to make those decisions and not having those kind of attachments that most people have with characters where it's like i don't want anything bad to happen to my character like vin's like nah screw it put them through hell um i want to give a shout out to b for like uh expert undeniable um play uh yeah the the other time i played a factotum it was a factotum for um the explorer and so it was very much like i'm a manservant i'm your footman let me go ahead and like do things for you and everything like that and i think like being a fact totem for the undeniable i really wanted to bring a different kind of energy uh which was like you said like that that manic devotion and this menace of like it's a it's a it's a fucking snake coiled up in a box that's ready to spring at any moment if you say one thing wrong to the your master um and b you really make it easy because you put your character in situations where it's like it's gonna be very easy for me to like react in a way that like not only checks off my dawn questions but also like um like makes interesting role-playing moments for me and it's like really satisfying as hell it's a very um, so, like um, it's a very like Black Butler style like like connection between the two of them, right? I don't think I've ever seen that very. Uh, that yeah, movie. yeah, it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is very Black Butler. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's actually one of the, like the major inspirations for it. And so like I'm like, and and like I've always wanted to play a character that's like I was saying it earlier. Like when I was talking with a friend, I was like, I always want to play support characters. I I want to be that person that's holding the ladder. Uh, and so anything that I can do, like mechanically to do that is also very cool. Uh, shout out to uh, Jason for the noises off sequence with uh, the grave digger and the shovel. I'm like, I left the shovel. And then like the walking up, hitting the third step and hitting the doorbell again. It's very absurdist, but it's also like just very like, to me, it, like it gave like odd couple vibes as well. And so like, I don't know, it, it was just like very, very fun um and like also a star to you for ramping up shit like you said okay you've played you've played one and a half sessions of the between now let's get into like around today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah it's the dark souls of the between that we experience where it's like double disadvantage and like just just slapping b in the face with conditions i made up a whole, I made up a whole ass rule <laughs> but it felt appropriate because of Perfect. the moon right yeah, yeah exactly yeah the moon and like it being the american and everything so like you really like played into that and like i always have fun with you you do such a good job with pain and like setting like 
hurdles for like players to like think like really critically think over and it's not just i commit violence or anything and also like a, one last star for you for putting putting a group of orphans in my way so i could you know do do uh do just just run roughshod and just like beat up a bunch of children um that's a, a, a dream of mine that i get to mark off my bingo like my, my checklist for ttrpgs uh and then tony 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 but not the music group um you went through such a wave of experiences during this session starting off with that coffee shop vulnerable move scene excellent just wonderful like you're such a great scene partner and so like in like you setting up different little like you're setting up different little trampolines for me to hop off of uh it, it felt like playing volleyball which is the second time i've made a volleyball uh illusion this week with with a car from brindlewood game which is weird but like you're so fun to play off of um and nox is such an interesting character uh that everybody's talking about like the monologue from the 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 unseen which is fantastic but like i really really loved that just like how you have nox interact with the world and different people and it's very much like when Knox is not actively elbow deep in somebody's like torso or like working on like doing doctor shit, like it's you're you're like on a haunted house ride and just commenting on things that happen past you. And there's just like such an eerie gentleness with Knox that it's like very unsettling, but it's comforting at the same time. It's very weird. Like there's such an interesting dichotomy with Knox. Uh, and it makes me want to crack open that brain of his and just see what's going on in there. Uh, I, I look forward to your flashback. My, that's my wish is uh, I can't wait to to hear that that next flashback because you always do such a great job with them. So it's like, uh, yeah, that's where I'm at. I just have a great time. Wonderful time. I already said some of my wishes, um, but I'll just uh, call it a couple more things from chat as well as other things in my head uh a star for the grave digger scenes thank you amanda those were really fun i love playing harley white and co um yeah it was a good one um so i have a star i have a lot of stars i've already said some of them there, there are some so many good things and you all have covered a lot of it already i really really some really kind of specific stars loved i loved Knox's um reaction to the blood spiral that scene was really terrific and it had such like almost like cosmic horror vibes you know like like lovecraftian vibes in a way so that was really really fun um and i also like how tony like kind of you know we were kind of like doing kind of role-playing tennis with this like three thing right this like everything in threes that was just it, it added this level of like weirdness to all of nox's scenes which were really really fun um totally quite fun and um and and I, and I and I always and and I always like I always view the decision to stay at Hargrave House for a night phase as an invitation to fuck with the character. So like um, I know what you were trying to do in that scene, but I knew what I was gonna do in that scene. Um, and so it was just I'm I'm just uh, I'm happy that you played along with it. Oh yeah, and it was a good sport about it. Um, it was really fun. Uh, love that we finally got to see Giveth. I was really happy to see Giveth, and I thought that was a really fun scene. Mr. Chesterfield was fun to play, and so I appreciate you giving me the chance to do that. I loved and... him. He was so fun. Holy <laughs> he shit. Was, he was, oh, he was great. Um, Delicious. He was fun to play. Um, and uh, I, 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 I love an undeniable who's in like chaotic filthy places like to me that's when the undeniable is best because they, they just stick out so much and you're like and everybody there re reacts to the undeniable like you have to focus on the undeniable there's like nothing else you can do right and so it's fun to like kind of let the characters uh live in that way i think and uh and giveth was so so good um and i was happy we got to see it um and a star for the follow-up scene though i thought langfist following up with mr chesterfield was a really excellent use of my person friday even though i intentionally uh, uh, kind of counter moved uh, at that point, um, but yeah, uh, I was just really happy with the with the sort of interesting tone. Uh, Vin's not here, but I will say I've already said it once, but I'll just say it again. I absolutely loved the sort of like little weird flirty 
date thing going on with Abigail Simpson. Um, I loved uh, Theodora showing up and getting involved in that. Um, I'm having fun playing Theodora. You know, I, I got to actually kind of play Theodora a little bit today. She is like, when I think about like my five favorite characters I've ever written, she's way up there, right? Um, and so I, I really love her. I love to play her. Um, you know, it's, I don't think anyone like will be surprised to hear that like in all of my games, I kind of like, write my keeper character into them you know and like theodora is definitely the between uh character that i that is my character so to speak um i love her by the way just a note theodora's a freaking delight a delight every time she's on screen I'm, I'm i'm playing her a little differently in this other podcast i'm doing that's not out yet um in that one i'm playing her as much more um much more menacing and almost psychotic uh but it's still it's still fun it's a different take on her but uh, but this is like classic Theodora in this campaign. I'm really digging it. Um, she's she's just such a good like sparring partner with the hunters, right? So, uh, but yeah, this was a great session. I really loved it. I really felt like I mean the last two sessions were great also, but this one really felt like a lot of things coming together and everybody kind of hitting their their groove. So yeah. yeah. I also will say one of my favorite moments for by then was them forgetting what they like after all the tension of the role, them not remembering what they had said they were gonna do yeah, based on the role <laughs> was such a I great know. amplification like, of like, we're, like doubling <laughs> down. But also, we I, will I, be back. I would have loved it. I would have loved it if 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 that or I would have loved it if if that role if they had gotten like a the, the other role. I would have loved Oh yeah. That would have been amazing. Oh yeah. But um uh, we will be back next week. Uh, I'll get on with Vin in the meantime, and we'll we'll work out some of the the tech issues. Um, uh, really glad to have them on, uh, and also really glad to be playing with all of y'all. Um, we are also again again a reminder we're going to be doing a giveaway this coming week, and we'll do one live next week. I promise. This time, uh, I just want to make sure we let people know a little bit more in advance. We failed to do that this week because of all my health stuff, uh, but. Over the next week, um, if you share your favorite moment from the between, I'll make a a post on all major social media sites. Uh, but also, if you share your favorite moment from the first three episodes, um, or if you just share it out and tag at plus one exp on whatever platform you're sharing it on, uh, we will go through and pick some favorites from those. Uh, we'll share them online, and we will pick one of the people who does that to give a copy of the uh, Brenda Wood Bay and nephews in Paris to um, also too so um, people always ask wherever you are in the world we'll figure it out don't worry about that like we want to get the stuff to you um, so so g- go nuts people yeah, in, in Australia um, <laughs> so um, with that said um, we've got a lot going on um, over the next little bit uh, keep an eye out for some other upcoming streams uh, we also we teased it out today uh, and maybe there'll be some uh, some public access work uh, going to be doing something in late June called Stream Away Camp. It'll be a week-long event of camp-related streams uh, and local games, uh, just encouraging people to get out there and play a new RPG. Public access is a great one if you're enjoying what we're doing here. Um, but we'll have history. some other mm-hmm. options as well. Um, with all that said, until next time, this has been a Plus One Gauntlet production of The Between. Bye, everybody.